Sergio, can you please stop sharing so I can share? I know. Yes, I will stop sharing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thank you. So It looks like everything was fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. People are joining, so let's wait for another couple of minutes and then start.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Uh, welcome to the workshop on Context Aware Recommender System, or CARS. Um, this is uh, one of the long-standing workshops, I guess, at Rexis. Uh, I, I believe the first one was 2010. So it's been going on for quite a while, uh, partly because of the importance of the role of context, as many of you know, uh, in recommender systems and many other domains. Um, we did have a hiatus for a couple of years, I think, uh, when uh, a lot of context-related uh, papers were being submitted to the main conference, and then new issues related to context uh, uh, have come up, and new models and new methods. So we started the uh, context of a recommender system workshops again. Um, so um, let me just uh, thank all of you for being here. Uh, and as well as people who are joining us online. Um, and uh, you see the organizers, uh, list of organizers here, uh, get us, Constantine, myself, Francesco, uh, Alex, and Moshe. Uh, unfortunately, Alex, Francesco, and get us cannot be here uh, due to various co conflicts. Uh, I especially want to thank Constantine and Moshe for doing most of the legwork and organizing work on the workshop and getting everything together. So uh, we have a nice program, uh, I think, in this uh, last afternoon of the uh, conference. Uh, we're going to have uh, two keynote speakers, both from academia and from industry. Um, uh, Sergio Ilari is going to uh, be speaking to us uh, from University of Zaragoza from uh, about mobile uh, context of our recommender systems from a data management perspective. And uh, later today, we're gonna have an industry keynote speaker, Jeffrey May from uh, Wafer, about contextual product recommendation. Uh, so those should be interesting. And in addition to these, we have uh, several papers uh, that were accepted for the workshop. They all uh, uh, sound pretty interesting. Um, and um, we're going to have a short break in between uh, uh, sort of, I, I don't know exactly when is that, 3.15 or so, um, and then come back for the final part of the, uh, uh, the session. So um, as other workshops, and as you can see, people can join, join via Zoom. If you're on Zoom, uh, please, if you have questions, you can put it in the chat for our speakers. Um, if you are uh, uh, speaking uh, here, then you should speak to this microphone because you know that's how uh, people on Zoom are going to hear you. Uh, otherwise, if you're on Zoom, please uh, mute your microphones uh, during the presentations. Uh, presenters, you have, uh, I think, 15 minutes uh, for each talk, and then five minutes we have for Q&A. So all of the material are going to be on the workshop website, and of course, you have access to uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the workshop, you can join the workshop uh, on Rex's hub. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Constantine, who's going to introduce uh, our first uh, keynote speaker. Thank you, Banshad. So I'm stop sharing. Oops. Okay, so it's my great honor to present our first guest speaker from academia. It's Professor Sergio Ilari. Sergio is a full professor in the area of computer languages and systems engineering at the University of Zaragoza. He is currently the coordinator of the computer science engineering degree in the School of Engineering and the architecture at the University of Zaragoza. He is also coordinator of the Cosmos Research Group. Um, his research interests include mobile computing, mobile agents, uh, uh, context of a recommend the systems, data streams, information systems, and semantic web. Uh, Sergio, please, floor is yours. Thank you. Please unmute yourself. Yes, I, I thank, thank you very much for the introduction, Constantine. Sorry, I was I, I didn't see the, the button to unmute myself. So I 
Uh, okay, first of all, I would like to, to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this keynote. It's a big pleasure for me to be here. Uh, it's a pity that I cannot be in Seattle with you, but uh, anyway, it's uh, for me, I'm very happy to be able to, to give this talk. And thank you for attending. Uh, good afternoon. Here in Spain, we have uh, nine hours difference, so it's uh, 11 p.m., so it's a long day today. So I will start the presentation. Uh, first, I will talk about the context of uh, my research, uh, mobile recommender systems, uh, our current national project, which is called Meet Ambience, and uh, our present and future work. So concerning the context of the research, I am currently leading the Cosmos Research Group, which is the Cosmos is the acronym of Computer Science for Complex System Modeling. It is a group uh, composed by five uh, people from faculty and several external team collaborators from around the world. And the overall objective is the design and development of complex systems. We understand as complex systems, systems that are composed by different subsystems, even persons of different technological domains, where there is an interaction among these subsystems, which could be co competitive or cooperative. But in any case, uh, it is usually very important to perform an efficient resource management. Uh, these systems are characterized by large scale dimensions and the need to look at non-functional requirements like economic costs, scalability, quality of service and fault tolerance. As application scenarios, we consider several ones. The most related to this talk is probably the smart city scenario. Uh, our approach is uh, to develop operative formal models using methods for modeling systems and also for the management of large volumes of data. And uh, what we do in the group is to build uh, realistic models for the analysis and simulation of complex systems, which usually requires large scale computing platforms. As specific goals, we have the development of methods to build realistic models of complex systems and their simulation, usually using formalisms like such as Petrinets, the exploitation of large scale distributed computing infrastructures, and finally, the development of techniques to manage and exploit large data volumes in different scenarios, uh, even with uncertain data. These uh, goals translate into three main research lines. The one I am working on is the third one, the data management line. And so uh, data management, it is uh, quite important uh, nowadays. It is usually said that data are the new oil, or today we would say the, the new gas. But uh, in the same way that we cannot uh, directly exploit oil uh, to do things. We actually use derivatives of oil, which are obtained using refineries. We also need to manage data, to handle data, and to transform it into something that uh, it is really usable. So suitable cleaning and data management is a must. By data management, we understand a variety of tasks that go from the data capture and collection until the data exploitation. And so, for example, in, in some projects uh, in the group, we have uh, been dealing with the, uh, the, the deployment of sensors around the city of Zaragoza in order to capture environmental data. And uh, well, we needed to deploy the sensors, calibrate them, maintain them, and also uh, develop models in order to estimate values uh, where we don't have the, the sensors. For example, uh, in some scenarios, we could uh, try to uh, model the flow of people uh, around a building in order to, to see how they are moving around uh, and only measure the actual location of the people at some points. 
So in this context, I have been mainly working on data management for mobile computing environments. So uh, the, the mobile users are in the center of, of my research. And um, I have been concerned about, uh, for example, uh, developing techniques for the processing of uh, continuous location dependent queries in distributed environments, for the deployment of semantic based location based services, also, uh, the, the, the development of a middleware, like for example, uh, data stream processing uh, architectures and uh, mobile agent technology, which is a, a technology that allows us to process data in a distributed environment, giving software the capability to move from one node to another node, from one device to another device, in order to process the data locally in each node. Uh, for example, uh, I have worked quite extensively on data management in vehicular networks, which are networks established uh, between vehicles in a completely other way using short range wireless communications. Here, uh, well, um, uh, one, one of the projects I have been working on is the VESPA project in cooperation with the University of Valenciennes in France. So what about recommender systems? I, I felt uh, quite overwhelmed while I was thinking about giving this presentation because I am rather my main research area is data management. And this workshop is organized and attended by very well-known researchers specialized in recommender systems. So how did it uh, all start regarding recommender systems for me? Well, it was uh, Maria del Carmen Rodriguez, uh, a student that uh, came from the University of Granade and asked me in 2013 to be her PhD supervisor. And she was working on recommender systems from a rather algorithmic point of view. And so I, I proposed her to, to try to apply the ideas of recommender systems uh, in, uh, in the context of mobile computing. So trying to mix both fields. So we started working on mobile context aware recommender systems, particularly considering scenarios uh, of uh, tourism for the recommendation of points of interest, but um, always thinking about uh, the, the possibility to exploit context in order to provide more relevant recommendations and taking into account that the context could be very, very highly dynamic. Like for example, the, the, the location of the user as a typical uh, context attribute. So my perspective about the related areas, probably a little bit biased, is like this. I see artificial intelligence, machine learning, data mining, information systems, information retrieval, mobile computing, context-aware computing. We have recommender systems and then uh, cars and uh, mobile cars. And I see it all under the umbrella of big data or data management. Specifically, I consider, as I said, uh, data management in distributed environments, uh, and mobile computing environments particularly, and always with the goal of providing relevant information to users for them to take suitable decisions. So now I will talk a little bit about uh, our work on mobile recommender systems, where we have considered uh, several key aspects. First, we would like to, to design, to develop uh, piece by piece a generic architecture that is not tied to any specific application domain. Then, as I said, the consideration of highly dynamic context data. Also, we are interested in distributed data management approaches as opposed to centralized solutions where all the data are stored in a single entity. We also want to consider novel constraints uh, as part of the recommendation process, constraints such as maximum room capacities or interpersonal distances, as I will explain later. And also um, a strong focus on simulations and user prototypes in order to 
evaluate or test uh, the, the proposals. So here we can see um, the, the architecture that, that we proposed, where we can distinguish several modules that uh, can be analyzed and a lot of work can, can be developed probably in each of these modules. We have, for example, a module for pool-based recommendations, another one for pool-based recommendations, and so on. And regarding prototypes, we have explored two main lines of research or two main types of prototypes. First, one prototype exploiting open data, that is data that is uh, available on the web and uh, usually using content-based recommenders. Uh, in this uh, line, I have to mention the PASEO project developed in, co in cooperation with the University of Bayonne in France, where we uh, developed uh, a prototype that is shown there on the picture, uh, collecting information which is uh, freely available about the region of uh, Aragon in Spain. And uh, we also analyzed some uh, poss possibilities, like, for example, exploiting the, the pictures that the user takes with uh, his or her mobile device in order to try to infer uh, from the pictures uh, the profile uh, or preferences of the user. And then another uh, type of prototype that uh, we have been exploring is uh, one where we exploit recommendation providers, what, what we call environment managers. I can explain it better with, with a, a picture. The idea is that we have several spatiotemporal uh, areas that are called environments. And then we have for each environment a server which is a recommendation provider uh, or environment manager, which provides recommendations for that environment. So for, ex for example, we may be here, this is the Museum of uh, Pop Music in Seattle, and receive recommendations about things to, to, to see in the museum. But at the same time, this user is also in Seattle. So uh, there could be another environment manager in Seattle that provides recommendations about other things that uh, the user can see in Seattle. So if uh, we focus on this, um, on the idea of push-based recommendations, uh, the workflow would be something as follows. We would have first a stage of recommendation triggering where depending on several uh, context uh, variables, uh, the mobile device decides if a specific type of recommendation should be triggered or not. These types of recommendations are communicated to the, environment, the corresponding environment uh, manager, along with some preferences of the user, non-private preferences that the user is willing to share with the environment manager. And so the environment manager can apply a pre-filtering step in order to obtain some, some items. Uh, then uh, over these items, a recommendation algorithm can be applied in the environment manager. The, the filter items or the items recommended are communicated to the mobile device. And in the mobile device, a post-filtering stage is executed where, for example, uh, conflict resolution can be applied and private preferences of the user that has not, have not been shared with the environment manager can be considered in order to refine the list of items that is finally shown to the user. So if we focus on the triggering aspect of, of, of all this process, we can highlight three key aspects. First, the rule-based engine is executed entirely on the mobile device of the user. So the decision about whether a specific type of recommendation should be activated or not is taken on the mobile device. So we don't need to be sending constantly context data to an external entity in order to take this decision. This helps to protect privacy and also um, the fact that uh, the user can decide which preferences are going to be shared when, with the environment manager. And finally, we give full power to the user. 
the user can customize exactly uh, how recommendations should be triggered. And we use, uh, as a rule-based engine, in our prototype, we use CD, which is a, a, a rule-based engine that can be executed as an Android device, as an Android service, sorry. So here I show some, exa some examples of uh, context rules that we can define. Context rules are simply a way to describe a specific situation. So for example, we have here a time-based context rule called lunch time, which says that for this user, lunch time is between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. Then we can define also calendar-based context rules, like this one here, where we select a specific days of the week or a specific dates. And we may have also location-based context rules. For example, the, the, the context rule at home with a specific location that corresponds to the home of the user. And finally, weather-based context rules. For example, here we defined a context rule called good for tourism, which specifies conditions that we consider that are good for tourism. This may, may of course, depend on, on the user. So with these context rules, we can define triggering rules that specify when a certain type of recommendation should be triggered. For example, here we defined a triggering rule called lunch outside that will be fired when, the, when it is lunch time and the user is not at home. And if this triggering rule is activated, then a recommendation of restaurants should be, um, should be fired, should be activated. We may have several triggering rules and enable and disable them as desired. And of course, we can also delete a triggering rule if it is not needed anymore. Then we can define exclusion sets, which uh, are uh, sets of types of recommendations that should be activated, that should not be activated at the same time. So we can define the priorities according to the order the, 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 the types of recommendations are listed. And we, can, we could have several exclusion sets that uh, are also listed in an order list uh, according to the preference of each, of each exclusion set. In case there is some conflict between them, then the, the one that is listed uh, on the top uh, has preference. Okay, I have, uh, I saw here some other snapshots of this prototype where, for example, the user can specify uh, the types of items he is in, or she is interested in, uh, the information that he or she is willing to share with the environment manager, and the list of contest rules that uh, he or she has defined. Okay, and some other snapshots with the uh, recommendations uh, received, uh, then uh, the user can rate them, etc. So now I will talk about our current work within the Neat Ambience project. The Neat Ambience project is a national project. Neat Ambience is the acronym of Next, Ge Next Generation Data Management to Foster Suitable Behaviors and the Resilience of Citizens Against Modern Challenges. Uh, we are a team of five uh, people and several uh, inter external international collaborators. And the general goal is the development of data management techniques suitable to help citizens in their daily life and to face modern challenges faced by society, like the ones derived from the COVID-19 pandemic and environmental protection, as well as similar challenges and threats that may appear in the future. This uh, can be um, translated into several specific goals. First, the development of a distributed data management framework to tackle the challenges of the modern citizen in a variety of scenarios. The design of next generation techniques for the development of mobile context-aware recommender systems and mobile information systems for drivers. And the illustration of the data management techniques developed with several use cases, tourism, resources for drivers, health and agriculture. So the motivation for this project is that uh, we are really overloaded with data. We have a variety of mobile information services, uh, intelligent environments, sensors, mobile apps. We don't even know 
how many mobile apps we have installed in our mobile, mobile phones. And at the same time, we need to handle this highly dynamic data in order to take decisions. This problem was already there for a long time, but as if this were not enough, there have been more recently changes in our society and how we interact with each other. I'm talking about mobility issues, climate change, uh, natural disasters, energy issues, and of course, uh, the, the pandemic of the COVID-19. So we believe that by raising social awareness, we can encourage responsible behaviors. And so the idea is that uh, we think that we can help in this direction by developing personalized information services that uh, help citizens to face the existing challenges. So as, as a paradigmatic example, we can cite the COVID-19, where despite many efforts, there are still significant difficulties. Uh, for example, uh, regarding the behavior of vaccines against new variants, uh, asymptomatic people, we all know uh, the, the preventive measures that we can adopt, like, for example, vaccination, cross-ventilation, and uh, social distancing. And uh, the idea here is that traditional data management techniques uh, could be extended and adapted, for example, to include in a natural way the concept of social distancing. Uh, here, I'm talking about social distancing in a very broad way. It could be the direct physical distancing between two people, but it could also be, for example, the number of persons in a room as compared to the maximum capacity established for that room, or it could be the level of CO2 in a given space, because all these have been shown to have a, an impact on the propagation of, of virus. So we believe that also specific information services can be developed to help live with the pandemic. So the idea would be to have some kind of digital vaccines or software systems, information systems that help us to take the, the most responsible decisions uh, to protect uh, everyone. This is important because a complete solution is not likely in the short term. Outbreaks of other similar epidemics are possible. And also beyond the COVID-19, integrating new social etiquette guidelines in the data management techniques can help to avoid uh, new lockdowns help people to perform their daily activities in the best possible way and avoid the propagation of other diseases, like for example, the flu, and in general, contribute to a safer and healthier society by uh, helping users, helping citizens to adopt responsible behavior. So we consider two types of systems in the ambience, mobile cars and information services for drivers. Of course, mobile cars is the focus of, of this presentation. I'm not going to talk about the other one. Um, we uh, consider, the idea is to consider in these two types of services, traditional optimization metrics, but also others that are not so um, frequently considered, like for example, risk, sustainability, equity, and respect to the environment. We advocate decentralized architectures and uh, the, the, we keep in mind the importance of uh, protecting data privacy and considering data ownership also. So, for example, regarding cars, uh, we have proposed the concept of site cards, social distance preserving cars, which exploiting location and trajectory data should be able to minimize the probability of risk for the user and other pedestrians in situations where there could be uh, health-related restrictions. So, of course, uh, when, when we consider sidecars, we could obtain some optimal solutions in terms of the estimated overall benefit for the user according to his or her preferences, but at the same time, we minimize the, the risk. So we have identified several challenges for sidecars, like the ones, the ones on, on the slide. Uh, just to cite a couple of them, very quickly, uh, the recommendation process should be uh, updated continuously in a very dynamic way. 
uh, and we should be able to detect relevant events. Like for example, uh, that uh, an area uh, has suddenly become, become overcrowded. And uh, probably we should also need some kind of in interdependent recommendations, which means that several uh, recommenders uh, should coordinate among themselves uh, in some way in order to avoid, for example, recommending to many users to go to the same item at the same, uh, at the same time, which could lead to, um, to an overcrowded situation. So we have developed, we have been working on the development of a tool for the simulation and definition of scenarios where we can evaluate recommender systems. Here we have a snapshot of, of this uh, tool with the, we are representing here a floor of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. We have the users in red, uh, the works of art, paintings and sculptures are, uh, around the, the different rooms and the doors communicating one room with, with another and stairs to communicate the floors. So uh, here the, the users move around visiting the different works of art and uh, providing ratings. And so we can um, evaluate different algorithms within uh, different recommendation algorithms in this scenario. We have here the editor, an, an example of a scenario uh, defined with the editor. And here uh, we have an example of another uh, scenario, which is a mall, uh, a popular mall in the city of Zaragoza in Spain, which is composed by three floors. We can define a variety of experimental parameters uh, in order to evaluate the, the algorithms. But the problem that we have here is that the rating data set is actually an input to RecMovisin. So, so RecMovisin does not simulate rate how users rate items. This has to be provided as an input. So how, we, how, how can we obtain a rating data set for the evaluation of cars? We know that there is uh, there are not so many uh, data sets available uh, that uh, contain context data and so we have developed a, a tool called data in cars which uh, has several uh, interesting features and is able to generate synthetic uh, data sets uh, for the evaluation of cars uh, from a given set of configuration files and also it is able to apply different workflows uh, in order to, for example, enlarge an existing data set, build a new data set from scratch and so on. But it has an important problem, which is uh, that it is not user-friendly at all. You have to define the input files manually, which is quite uh, cumbersome. And then uh, you also have to program your workflows. So it, this is not nice. So we have been working on a, a tool called Auto Data in Cars, which provides a graphical user interface on top of uh, Data in Cars and allows you, for example, uh, to define graphically the, the workflows. This is a work in progress, but well, we, we have uh, some, some results already using this tool. So as an example, let us consider uh, uh, the scenario of a museum, recommendations in a museum, and the goal is to maximize the satisfaction of the user while minimizing the risk. So we have users providing ratings in an explicit or implicit way, and then we have a user that has a limited amount of time to visit the museum. This has happened to me in several conferences where you have maybe a, a free afternoon and you have one, two hours to visit a, a large museum in a city. So it would be nice in this situation, I missed in this situation, a mobile app that uh, was able to recommend me uh, a trajectory within the museum to see uh, specific uh, paintings that I could find uh, satisfactory. And these considering aspects such as, of course, the preferences of the user, but also other elements like the number of people in the room and the social distance, the mood of the user, etc. Besides, as I said before, we uh, consider uh, mobile peer-to-peer -peer architectures. So in this case, when a user provides a rating, 
the rating data is propagated in the network by hopping from uh, user to user in a completely decentralized infrastructure using uh, mobile ad hoc communications, short range communication. So in this scenario, we have uh, proposed a trajectory based, uh, a trajectory aware recommendation approach, which uh, basically uh, starts by applying a baseline to attack the cold start problem. And then when it has enough data, it applies a user-based collaborative filtering approach uh, and reorders the list of items in order to compose a consistent uh, and reasonable trajectory. Then we have a path, and this path has to be updated when there are uh, when there is a significant amount of new rating data. Also, when the user is going to leave the room, because maybe there is something missing in the room that could be interesting for the user, so we will compute just in case. And when the user disobeys the path. Well, we have compared this peer-to-peer uh, -peer approach with several baselines, uh, a random approach, completely random approach, an exhaustive recommendation approach, a nearest point of interest recommendation, where the nearest point could also be a door leading to another room. And also with the same approach, the same trajectory away approach, but using a centralized solution that is uh, storing all the data in a single entity, and also two ideal uh, approaches that assume knowledge about ratings that have not, have not been yet provided by the user. So it's totally unrealistic, but it could give us uh, an upper bound of the, the performance that we could obtain. What is missing so far, and we are working on that, uh, is approaches considering the social distance. So uh, we have obtained some preliminary some results uh, in this uh, scenario of the museum, which are quite promising, but we need to perform more experiments. The peer-to-peer -peer approach uh, achieves good results in terms of the average user satisfaction and uh, not far from the centralized solution. Um, as I said, there is another type of system that we consider in, in it ambience. And uh, here I, I saw a snapshot of a, a pro prototype that simulates uh, parking lots. So the idea in this case is to recommend uh, dri a driver to recommend a suitable parking spot, which are the black uh, rectangles. We have here users, which are the white circles. Uh, which are pedestrians moving around the parking lot. And so we can see that most pedestrians uh, concentrate near the exit of the parking lot and also uh, on the pedestrian walkway. And we are identifying clusters of pedestrians, which are the different uh, color areas. So the idea here is to try to recommend a parking spot that minimizes the risk uh, the, the, the possible contacts, the possible interactions with other pedestrians. This is important, especially in underground parkings, uh, where the ventilation is usually poor, and it has been shown that uh, this is uh, an ideal scenario for virus propagation. So. Okay, so as present and future work, I should say that uh, NEAT Ambience has been conceived as a four-year project. Uh, we have just, uh, well, we are about to start the second year in, in a few days. But uh, beyond neat ambience, there is, uh, I think, there is a wide variety of research issues that could be considered. For, I am just going to mention one, which is this first item. Uh, okay, we, we developed a recommender system. We suggest something to the user, but what the user is going to do is uh, unknown, okay? So there is a gap between the recommendation, the information provided to the user, and the action performed by the user, the behavior followed by the user. So we think that it could be interesting to analyze this gap in cooperation, perhaps with psychologists or people specialized in, in social behavior. Then um, I am also part of, uh, of Sensorizar, 
which is a, a multidisciplinary team of people uh, working on the development of an IoT ecosystem as a learning factory for a smart campus. Uh, it is, uh, we are here people of all the ideas of uh, engineering and also architectures, architecture. And um, the main idea of the group is to listen to what buildings have to tell us. So we deploy sensors in buildings, uh, in the campus, and measure parameters of different uh, types. Uh, for example, the temperature, but also the level of CO2, which has been quite important at the university during the, the, the worst times of the COVID-19, uh, because uh, it was uh, a key issue to, to keep a good uh, air quality in the in the different rooms where classes uh, were taking place. So uh, this is an example of a dashboard uh, developed by the group. And uh, we can imagine that with this data, we could uh, try to develop a variety of information services to exploit all this information. There are also other actions that we are performing on mobile cars, like for example, uh, the uh, application of techniques from the field of spatial databases in, in the field of recommender systems that we are also exploring. Before finishing, I would like to acknowledge my main collaborators on this area. They are shown here on the slide. And Okay, I think that uh, during these uh, unfortunate times, we have learned a lot about waves. Uh, a new wave is coming, a digital data web wave. And so we have to work hard to avoid being trapped by the wave by developing appropriate data management techniques. And I think that in this area, recommender systems have a, a lot to say in order to alleviate the, the overload, the data overload, um, the data flooding that we are experiencing. Okay, thank you very much. And any question is welcome. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sergio. That was a great presentation. Do we have any comments? If you're here in the audience, please come to the mic or you can post your questions in chat. Thanks for this great talk of yours. Um, I'm just a little bit wondering. So, I mean, you showed us these graphics and especially these, this Disney Museum that was pretty impressive. Um, I'm wondering, you're basically creating and storing and analyzing movement profiles of people here. Um, how does this actually can be brought into alignment with GDPR and such a policy? That would be my first question. And the second one, would be um, you also mentioned yeah you you will want you prefer you want decentral storage and and uh, computation and you said like that the data hops from device to device and I wonder how how do you um, ensure the privacy of the data? Mm -hmm. Okay, it. so yeah. yes, if I understood well the question, it is about the yes, the, the mobile peer to peer approach and uh, the relation to the data privacy, right? Um, Correct. Okay, so um, well, um, the the mobile peer to peer approach what what tries to achieve is to avoid having uh, a central server storing all the data. So the the hypothesis behind this is that um, the data the rating data may have some kind of spatio temporal relevance. So um, we are assuming that uh, the for example if you are in a museum, the ratings that uh, are provided regarding items that are not very far from you are more relevant. So uh, it, it should be, um, I mean, as we distribute, the data is uh, completely distributed among the devices. We don't have a single entity having a complete knowledge of, of the environment. Uh, well, this could help uh, somehow to reduce the, the privacy issues, the privacy concerns. You are not sharing your data, your ratings 
with a central entity, but just with your neighbor. That's the, the idea. So uh, this is one of the potential advantages of the mobile peer-to-peer -peer approach. It's not the, the single one, but it's, it is one that uh, it could be important in, in that sense. Of course, um, yes, someone could argue that, okay, you are anyway sharing your, your rating data and this could, uh, maybe you don't want to do that. Well, in that case, of course, uh, we should adapt uh, other type of uh, recommendation approach uh, where, where you don't collaborate with your rating data, uh, like, like the content-based recommendation approach, right? But uh, this is the main idea. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. You're welcome. All right, so there is a question in chat. What is the reason for decentralized state management? Is it specific to mobile use case or different reasons? So you talk about that. Is anything else you want to say? Um, no, I, I think that it's, it's probably, I see it like the, the same question, right? Uh, one, one consideration could be data privacy and uh, um, then, uh, of course, uh, when, when, when you have a mobile peer-to-peer -peer solution, uh, you, you don't need an infrastructure. This could uh, be another advantage. So, for example, in the museum, you don't need to have any kind of, uh, of course, central server, but also you could avoid uh, the need to have uh, long range, com uh, 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 sorry, uh, long range communication. You don't need even to have uh, cell cellular coverage or anything like that. You you just use uh, short range wireless communications, like Wi-Fi Direct, for example, to communicate with your neighbors. So this is completely free in in all the cases, and so uh, it could be in that sense, more economic and more reliable. That's the, I mean, when when you have, but this is not particular to recommender systems. I mean, when you, when a, a solution, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, solution is proposed in a mobile environment, well, these are usually the reasons to, or the, the advantages of this kind of approaches. All right, thank you. Then the next question, uh, exploit the context may impact user privacy. What measures should be taken to preserve this privacy? How do you compare this approach with the federated learning approach? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer because the, the federated learning is um, quite new. Uh, the, the main difference, I think, is that uh, this, um, the, the, the idea of this spatiotemporal relevance, because uh, here we are not applying a, a federated learning approach per se. Actually, it is more like uh, the data are uh, distributed and shared in the neighborhood according to a spatiotemporal criteria. And uh, this, the, the, the way of propagation of the data uh, could follow different mechanisms. Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned in the slide, in the example, I saw I showed uh, one possible uh, propagation mechanism, which is basically uh, the furthest data for the, the furthest neighbor forwards the data, right? But there are many uh, possibilities to decide how the data should be propagated in the network, taking into account this kind of criteria. And I think this is the main difference, uh, the, that here the focus is rather on, on how the data is shared. And so, uh, okay, the data is shared and then each device has a limited view of the world, right? Uh, each device knows a little bit about its environment and that's it. And then we apply the standard recommendation algorithms uh, within the device. So this is, uh, I think, uh, an important difference regarding federated learning. But anyway, um, I find the question very interesting because we would also like to, 
to analyze uh, and compare more in detail uh, this peer-to-peer -peer approach with federated learning to see how, how it behaves. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I have last question if there are no other questions. So I really love your recommendation of uh, paintings in art museum. I would love to follow such recommendations and avoid some boring painting. So you mentioned some context, uh, which was like the user has only one hour to visit the museum and has to see the most important paintings for them. So, but I suppose that during their uh, like walking on the path, they will see some other paintings which will hmm. definitely affect their experience. Should you also hmm. consider those paintings on the path to recommended paintings uh, as a context in this uh, recommendation application? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's correct. Uh, and it's a very good comment also. Uh, and it is uh, related um, with, the, with this idea of uh, user disobedience, right? The user may find something interesting in the path that the system has not recommended. And so what we do in that case, uh, well, we adopt a very simple approach, maybe some more sophisticated uh, approach could be adopted. But what we do is if we notice that the user is disobeying the system, uh, it stops at another painting that has not been recommended, then uh, we update the recommendation. I mean, we execute again the, the algorithm because maybe something happens or there have been changes uh, or now we have more information about the user because the user has stopped in an item that we didn't think it was important in order to update the recommendation. The same happens when the user, for example, is going to leave the room. If the user is going to leave the room, Okay, this is an important change in the trajectory of the user. And so we reconsider and we say, okay, is there something else in the room that the user could watch? And so we, we check this. And these are the, the, the approaches that we are applying right now. But of course, it could be possible to refine this. Okay, thank you so much. Do you have other questions? Now let's thank the speaker. Thank you so thank much. You for joining us this late hour thank you thank so you very please, much thank you thank you. uh please stop sharing your screen yes. i'm trying and... no okay <laughs> yeah perfect thank you so next we have a presentation of our first paper uh, it's called modeling and leveraging prerequisite context in recommendations uh, presented by Heng Chang Hu. So the speaker is online. Uh, wait a second, I'm going to uh, continue so we can see you. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you see me and hear, heard my voice? Yeah, perfect. We see you. Yeah, perfect. Good. So, okay. So can we go right now? Yeah, we so, see your slides, everything is perfect. Okay, so okay, so thank you for your introduction for me and thanks for Prof. Sergio for his insightful ideas and uh, application driven models in various contexts. I mean, the in the real context. In our work, uh, we mainly introduce an abstract context. So it's about the knowledge context. Uh, we term the prerequisite uh, so to start from uh, self-introduction first, uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, Hen Chang, so currently the PhD candidate in National University of Singapore. So actually it's uh, early morning in my place. So uh, just, uh, to start from the motivation, so generally context is defined as certain of circumstance. So that influence uses users' decisions, so such as uh, like Prof. Sergio's have introduced this one. So for example, the temporal context and locational context, so which are the most to discussed topics. So this the example in this slide shows a form of context season. 
so so such as additional this context contextual feature so it should be interacted with users feature in some means and thus be helpful for recommending the right item to her so in our case the prerequisite is also can be termed as a special kind of context it's about the knowledge context so as a human when we want to make some decision it's uh, better for us to have some prior knowledge so such uh, for example oh, uh, as the example in this slide. So uh, actually the prerequisite is usually discussed in the educational scenario, uh, especially in course selection. So in the example here, so if a user learned uh, Bayes theory, so by consider her prerequisite context and interacting it with prerequisite driving factors from the prerequisite graph uh, that's showing in the middle part. So so it's optimal to recommend the courses, including posterior prob the probability concept. Uh, so although the prerequisite is uh, generally discussed in educational scenario, it's still helpful in non-educational scenario. So the left part is an example that's showing that having prerequisite knowledge can make the student perform perform better in class. And the right part is another example of the fictions uh, sequential selection. This is my uh, favorite fictions. Uh, so in this example, only if you have the preconditional knowledge of ball lightning. So this is a imaginary uh, physical phenomenon uh, so that you can have a better understanding of next theory, the, the, the tree body problem. So. So we just term these two phenomena as the hard requirement and soft constraint. So we are both are beneficial for a better recommendation. Uh, so for prerequisite modeling, uh, we focus on the concept level. So as for now, the challenge of introducing such knowledge context for user lies in uh, two perspective. So the first one is the about the prerequisite graph construction cost lots. So uh, so you may know the usually the menu design the meta paths in the graphs uh, may need a lot of labor and it is domain restricted as well. So and the second, the user's knowledge structure is very difficult to ob obtain. So this abstract contact is not easy to, to get. So there is a lack of students uh, on the impact of user prior knowledge and target knowledge on the decision. So regarding the, as mentioned the challenge, uh, we construct the prerequisite knowledge in an automatic way and pre-process the data set to facilitate our, uh, we call it PDR research, that is prerequisite driven recommendation. So, uh, the approach is shown in the following few slides. So the approach is usually the most boring part, but most practical part as well. So I would like to sh share how we did this uh, to all of you guys. So the first step is uh, to, so we need to construct the prerequisite graph in the first, right? So the, the basic part is to identify the concept accurately related to item core topics. So I give an example here of how we did the key concept instruction. So for each item, we have the item documents, including the title and the, the body contents. So well, the title is, uh, well, the title is determined as the most central discussed topics. So, uh, so that's the uh, key concept at, uh, are termed the most relevant ones to the items, but the limited concepts from the titles are not enough. Uh, we we further extend extensively uh, extract other candidate concepts from content as well. So so the second uh, the candidate concept extraction we just use the POS uh, tag pattern matching to find all the non tokens. For example, in this case, all Non and non plus non and uh, adjective plus non. So all the non tokens are extracted. 
but only part of the concept from the candidates can be chosen as the final topic related content. To, fil to filter out the irrelevant one, we apply the propagating process. Uh, it uh, basically ex explain, uh, expands the seed concept seed uh, in a fully connected graph, uh, where we, we linked where we linked uh, with the linked uh, seed concept with candidate concept by similarity of the pre-trained word embedding. So after propagating iteratively to the converged status, so the remaining expanded set of the concept is termed the key concept. So the next part is, so given the obtained concept, uh, which we no noted as small c. So the next step is to get the features which we need for identifying the prerequisite linkage between every pair of concepts. So the first one is super straightforward. It calculates the cosine similarity between the concept of word embedding. And the second one, the other one is, uh, uh, is uh, the other two are constructed from both in-domain and ex-domain. So specifically the uh, 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 symmetry distance measure the imbalance in item sequence. So because uh, this is because that we observe that concepts covered in the uh, subsequently consumed item are often dependent on those in previous one. So uh, that is, we, they are most likely prerequisite in an item sequence. And the reference distance calculates the normalized distance score from their related Wikipedia concepts. So the motivation is based on that. Uh, well, Wiki concept A referred to the article well uh, with concept B, but not vice versa. Uh, it's most likely that B is the prerequisite of A, but the, but because the wiki concept may not occur in our domain, we just introduce omega again to bridge our domain to uh, and the wiki domain by identifying the most related concept in Wikipedia. Uh, to obtain the final uh, prerequisite linkage score, uh, we trained a log logistic regression by semi-supervision over a few annotated samples, so about 300 per data set. So for each annotation, we, uh, for the concept pairs, we annotate one, minus one, or zero to represent whether the A is prerequisite B or B is prerequisite of A, or if there is no obvious prerequisite relation between two concepts. So the regression is learned by adjusting the uh, contribution weights for these three features given. So for the recommenda recommendation part, we majorly apply the, the, the MLP, so which is a simple yet effective method. So actually specifically, we use two MLPs to encode the concept in the prerequisite graph and uh, use the item uh, interaction, uh, I mean, from their interaction matrix. Uh, so in the pre-training st stage, uh, so which is the left part, so we have multi-objective. One is to learn the uh, prerequisite linkage and another is to learn the user behaviors. So in the tuning part, we further tune the embedding parameters through joint training that alternatively applies the objective of concept representation learning and the final recommendation. So, so, so far, uh, this is the approach. So, so, so to repeat again, we build the prerequisite graph, and then we apply this prerequisite graph uh, to the recommendation. So, but but due to the lack of suitable data sets, uh, we split the current data into different parts and only use the middle part for our study. Uh, uh, so specifically, the uh, the knowledge we uh, we mentioned about that. Uh, so they are extracting uh, source is built in different manner. So as shown in the table, uh, we, initial, we in initially have the UI interaction data with different scales. Uh, and further, based on the given like movie name and book ID, we scroll the rich content to fulfill the item documents from various sources to enrich our data set. So, uh, okay, so to the experiment part. 
so for the metrics we apply the ranking based one so which is the mostly the the recommendation scenario so and unsurprisingly our pdrs that is our model is the best uh, where prerequisite contacts improve the performance significantly and gcmc and dfm uh so i think many of you know so uh they are effective contacts are well recommend recommended baselines and they also improve dramatically with the additional of encoded prerequisite information but the only exception is the item k uh, in the course scenario we believe that this is due to the uh, different a uh, very different level of sparsity on the item side in this very extremely unbalanced data set. So further, uh, we also conduct the ablation study to, uh, to study which led the performance rise in different scenario. So the CPCI and CD, CT represent uh, user prior knowledge, uh, item knowledge, and the user target knowledge. So, uh, so this from two sides, uh, right? So from the user side and from the author side. So, so firstly, we look at the uh, with a intro uh, with a single uh, context introduced. We find the the course recommendation rely on user prime knowledge most, and the movie recommendation rely on item knowledge most. So this is very interesting. So that. So we find that in the like educational scenario, uh, only when we know the user's uh, knowledge context, we can, uh, so that we can recommend the right item to him. So, and further, when we look at the, in the table, still in the table, when we look at the, for both source contacts introduced, uh, that is introducing progressive knowledge context from both item and the user side, is always better than use using single side information, which proves that our prerequisites indeed bridge users and items. So also, because our PDRS relies on accurate prerequisite uh, information, so we also need to verify its reliability. So we take two statistically code-based methods. So in the left in the left table, so the HPM and RD as our baseline. So firstly, the both uh, the uh, symmetric distance and the final our KPL outperform the other baseline. So so this is the one uh, evidence that our uh, prerequisite information is accurate. And in the right table, we also list some case. So show some example of, of what the prerequisite uh, linkage in our data set looks like. So take the course as example. So, so the large positive KLP score indicates the concept of machine learning is a prerequisite of the concepts in the table. So for example, the feature learning uh, I mean, in the right in, in the right place, the feature learning and the deep learning, which is basically acceptable for us, that they are the uh, the the machine learning are the prerequisite of these two concepts. So uh, the prerequisite link in, in other two data sets is less intuitive but still meaningful, nonetheless. And we also try to compare the PDRS in course recommendation against baseline in user and the item code code star scenario. So the uh, uh, so the user code star scenario usually also called the new user scenario. So from the table, so both item user star is more serious than uh, uh, user code star. Yeah, the item code star is serious than user code star. You can see the score, right? Different lots. So and by comparing the use of uh, use user side information in user code star problem, we uh, observe the advantage of user information. The same applies to item with item information linking item to uh, user through knowledge linkage. Uh, so to conclude, uh, to the best of knowledge, we are the first to explore the use of prerequisites for recommendation, which is an overlooked but crucial form of context. 
And secondly, in this work, we introduced an automatic way to construct prerequisite linkage at the concept level. It helps uh, utilize prerequisite context. And in the method part, we adopt joint training to optimize model for both uh, linking the prerequisite relation and the recommendation. And in the experiment, we demonstrate its effectiveness. So, so, so far as now, uh, we hope our work can provide some insights for all of you guys. Yeah, so that is all for my presentation today. All right. Thank you, Hao Cheng. Um, do you have any questions? So either Mike, if you're here, or all them in chat. We have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, also, if you have uh, some other detail, a uh, question about details, you can contact me with my email. I I, I, I write it in the slide. I'm, I'm not sure whether you can see that, but okay. like it's, Here is the, uh, here's the question coming. Yeah, we have a person. Uh, just a short clarification question. You said you use like um, the first 30% of prerequisite concepts and these last um, 20% of target as target concepts as as training set and you validate on the 50% in between is that correct oh no the, uh, actually no, that is not correct so in our experiment we left the, the first percent uh like 30% and the last 20% as the like we term it as the for building the uh for building the users uh knowledge context and only use the middle part for training the interaction. So there is no data leakage. So I know oh, uh, what okay, you are asking okay. for. You understood what I was going for. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Th thanks for clarifying. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I'll show you have a question. Okay. So thank you for your presentation. I have a question about um, the separation between the graph and the neural networks. Why do you think you need this kind of separation? Does the first like uh, extracting the concepts using the graph helps you with a better interpretation of those uh, concepts? Or have you tried to do like an end-to-end -end learning when you can put everything inside the neural networks and not separate the two tasks? Oh, okay, thank you. So actually this is a good question. So, uh... So I need to say the major reason is like you already explained. So because this is the first task that that's nobody used the prerequisite information in this system. So we need to validate that the prerequisite, uh, prerequisite information is acceptable still uh, like at least for human. So otherwise we can know that whether this information is about prerequisite or some other like uh, information that's co-occurrence or sound, we, we don't know. So we need to make sure that it is prerequisite first, then we can like uh, validate that, confirm that this special information is indeed helpful for recommendation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank now you. In, our, in our schedule, we have a break for 15 minutes so right now is 3 15 in seattle so please come back at 3 30.
All right, so let's continue. Hello everyone and welcome back to our second session. So my name is Moshe Unger and I'm from Tel Aviv University. Um, in the next session, we'll start with a keynote speaker, industry keynote speaker, and then the rest of uh, three of the papers that were accepted to the uh, workshop. So I'm very glad to introduce uh, Jeffrey May from Wafer. Um, and uh, Dr. Jeffrey May is a senior uh, data scientist uh, at Wafer in Boston. And he completed his PhD in MIT and focusing on convolutional neural networks to quantify textual features. Um, at Wafer, he developed a sequential recommender system that adapts to changing customer tastes using transformers, as we all know, and incorporated insights of customer behavior to make specific e-commerce tweaks to the model architecture. He's currently working on quantifying style in order to facilitate um, style transfer across different product categories and probably will tell us more about it um, in his presentation. So let's uh, welcome uh, Jeffrey. Uh, hello, yeah, so thank you for that introduction. Um, so yeah, as Mashi said, I'm here to talk about our, uh, how we use contextual information to inform our product recommendations at Wayfair. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, that works for you. Okay, yeah. Okay, so a quick about us, in case you don't know, Wafer is an e-commerce company uh, where people can buy home goods, including anything from beds, rugs, dishwashers, uh, wall art, even bathroom mirrors, and so on. And we have tens of millions of items in our catalog and around 30 million active users. Our main business is in the US, though we do have extra stores in Canada, UK, and Germany. So before we start talking about how we use context, let's just quickly define it for the purposes of this presentation. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, so following work by Gerdas Adamovicius will distinguish between static and dynamic contexts. So static contexts, like also called representational ones, are those which are known a priori like location and time, which we do use that way for to some extent. Though with respect to our personalization team, which is what I'm on, we are primarily focused on this dynamic context. And this is a little more uh, abstract and is entwined with customer browse. So for example, customers may initially be very interested in a leather sofa, but after some browsing realize they actually want a sleeper sofa. Uh, similarly, customers may initially uh, just be browsing the site with no intention of buying anything, but if we can show them the right item, or which in some cases may even be the, uh, the same item, they may change their mind and then ultimately order something. So as I said earlier, we don't use a lot of static context, but let's look at some examples. So for new customers landing on our site for the first time, we can use their location to guess what type of furniture we should promote to them. It will probably not surprise you that in California, people buy a lot more, for example, office furniture than say in North Dakota, where they buy more bedding sets. And this is likely simply because there are you know, many offices in California. One way we can use this is, for example, by positioning sales events for new customers who land on our site for the first time. Obviously, once they browse something, then we have a good sense of what they actually want to buy, and then we can show those kinds of furniture instead. But for new customers for whom we know nothing, this is a very good first guess. Another way we use location at Wayfair is to optimize shipping. So as it stands, you can order any item in the US catalog from anywhere else in the US for the exact same price. But due to a finite number of warehouses, there can be very big differences in shipping time and also shipping cost, uh, depending on where the nearest warehouse with inventory is. 
large shipping distances have negatives for us as a business because we are charging the same price, even though we are paying more for shipping, which means we make less profit. Uh, they have negatives for the supplier because uh, these items are more likely to be damaged in transit and therefore need to be replaced at their, at their own cost. They also have negatives for the customer because the customer has to wait longer to receive their order and they are more likely to receive a faulty good. Our GeoSort project attempts to push up more closely positioned items in order to reduce these shipping costs. This will naturally reduce order rates somewhat because customers are uh, being given recommendations from a smaller set of candidates, which means that the recommendation quality must deteriorate slightly. However, if we can reduce shipping costs more than we reduce order rates, then the, we do gain net profitability, which is increasingly important in today's economic climate. So up to now, I've just talked about the Wafer US store, which is our main store. Uh, and as I said earlier, we have other stores in Canada, Germany, and UK. And these have slightly different catalogs and also different customer behavior. So what this means is we have to train a separate model for each country. In terms of customer behavior, there are some similarities. For example, you can see on the left, customers kind of universally like to prefer, prefer to buy previously viewed items as opposed to new items uh, by a four to, four to one ratio. And this is kind of consistent across all stores. However, there is some variation in the consideration cycle. And what I mean by this is that customers, for example, in Canada will browse twice as many items before settling on an order as opposed to our customers in the UK. In tandem with our previous finding that customers like to buy previously viewed items, this means that it's much harder for us to show these resurfaced items to our Canadian customers because they are, uh, because they are more candidates to choose from due to them having browsed more items. This also means that our, our models need to take into account how far along in the customer consideration cycle a customer is, uh, i.e. how long their browse context is, because this will determine what mixture of new versus previously, previously viewed items we should recommend. So a deeper look at the customer consideration cycle, it probably will not surprise you that this depends greatly on the type of furniture you are browsing. For example, customers will spend roughly twice as much time personalizing their indoor furniture as opposed to their outdoor furniture. And this is kind of true uh, in all of our different stores in different countries. However, there are also location differences. For example, I, I showed earlier that our North American customers typically spend uh, more time browsing before reaching an order as opposed to our European customers by around 50%. Here is just a humorous tangent I came across when compiling the data for the previous slide. So in Canada and the US, uh, customers will spend twice as much time choosing their own bed around 20 days as opposed to their teenage child's bed around 10 days. And in the UK, it, these are both roughly 10 days. However, in Germany, parents will still spend 10 days choosing their own bed, but virtually all teenage beds we sell in Germany are ordered on the same day as they are first browsed. So, Obviously, we are not sociologists, and you know, correlation does not imply causation, but you may draw conclusions about parenting styles in different cultures at your own risk. So now let's talk about this dynamic context, which I said is the bread and butter of our personalization effort. So the model I'm talking about today is called Mars, which is a multi-headed attention recommender system, and it uses self-attention to handle a sequential input and provide recommendations. So for each item in a customer's browse sequence, we will map this item name to a dictionary of learned item embeddings. Uh, we will also encode the position in the sequence, for example, whether it's the most recent view or an older view. And we will also store the interaction type, which we call funnel stage, uh, which is whether it's a view, add to cart, or order. These embeddings, which are all learned separately, are added together and then passed through the self-attention layer which uh, where it learns which items are relevant to, to generate this next recommendation. Uh, this is then passed to a feed for network and you can stack this if necessary. Um, our architecture uses three uh, layers, but there's you know, no particular reason you, could, you couldn't use more. And ultimately it will score and then rank a set of candidates that we pass it. And it's almost entirely based off SASREC, which I linked here, but you can also find on GitHub. 
So here's an example of it in action. I already showed this on Wednesday, so apologies if you saw this already. Basically, I'm seeing these default recs, which are best sellers because I have no browsing history. And now I'm going to click on these kind of blue abstract art rugs, which I like. And after I've clicked on a few of these, I can then refresh the page and you can see that the resulting recommendations are now much more stylistically consistent with this kind of abstract art blue theme, which I said I liked. So let's talk a little bit, a little bit about why the sequential part is so important. So we'll look at what happens when a customer changes browsing style. So here, this customer's browse is shown above. They've browsed three black and white geometric rugs, and then they've kind of changed their mind and decided to go for some more colorful rugs. You can see a floral rug and then a nautical rug. So using a standard matrix factorization method, you can see that the majority browse dominates. And the recommendations are all these kind of black and white geometric styles, which are no longer relevant to the customer. And it's essentially ignoring the most recent browse of the more colorful rugs. In contrast, using MARDS, we are able to pick out the sequential information. And so, and above, I show the attention weights for the final layer. Uh, basically, the darker the title of the item, the more attention is being paid. So you can see that it's paying the most attention to the final item, though it's also not ignoring the first items either. And this kind of manifests in the recommendations. So you can see that these top recommendations are these kind of uh, nautical geometric rugs, they're kind of dark blue, but still geometric, and which are based off the first and last items, basically. Uh, in addition, we have these kind of floral nautical rugs, which are kind of like a hybrid of the final two items that the customer has browsed. And of course, they are just some, you know, general nautical rugs and some general black and white rugs as well in the browse sequence. There's a large variety of different styles of rugs in this um, set of recommendations because the browse history is so short. You can probably imagine if we browsed more and more nautical rugs, it would eventually recommend fewer and fewer black and white rugs. The fact that these styles are kind of being hybridized is interesting, uh, and we will, we will return to this point later. So now let's look at how this attention works. So first we'll look at the positional part, which is how Mars can learn to make sense of the order in which uh, we are viewing items. And then we will look at the actual learned attention weights, which show how it identifies which items are actually relevant. So here I show the positional embeddings. Uh, each row starting from top to bottom is just the, the embedding for that position. The top is the most recently viewed item and the bottom is the least recently viewed item. And we truncate this length at 100. Um, so there are kind of two flavors of positional embeddings. The first school is kind of these pre-computed ones as, as was the case in the original transformer paper. You see that one below. And uh, however, recently other papers like GPT and also, for example, SASREC have been using these learned embeddings, which are updated during training. Uh, the, it doesn't really matter what the like, actual embeddings look like. The key point is how similar they are to each other, and which is what you see on the right. So you can see in both cases that main diagonal is, has a high similarity. And obviously, this is because each position is most similar to itself. However, you can also see there's kind of this wide band of uh, similar, like high similarity. Uh, and that this band is much wider for the, the learn embeddings above. So this is, uh, so I, I want to know that the original uh, set of positional embeddings that were pre-computed in the original transformer paper were designed for um, natural language processing. And I would argue that words in a sentence are probably uh, less interchangeable than items in a browse sequence. And that may be why we see um, the, this, the, pre, the learned embeddings have like a much wider band of similarity. So uh, just to give you some numbers, you can see, uh, maybe you can see in the numbers in the chart, but for the pre-learned, sorry, for the learned embeddings, the band is kind of like plus or minus 10, whereas for the pre-computer ones, it's kind of like plus or minus three. So that means that uh, items with, within these, this kind of positional range are considered fairly interchangeable. This might also be why that we, we found that using learned embeddings for the position were better than using pre-computed ones for our use case. Uh, sim alternatively, I guess we could also have used a pre-computed one that had a much wider band of similarity. So now we look at the attention weights. Uh, here we show the most recent 100 item interactions for a random user. And so several things stick out here. Uh, firstly, and in, in line with the original SASREC paper, we found we find that earlier attention blocks 
uh, are learning more longer term time dependencies, whereas later blocks learn more fine kind of short term dependencies. And this again was originally theorized uh, in the Kanga McOley paper as probably because the earlier layers are learning the longer term dependencies so that the later ones do not need to as well. Secondly, you can see that these attention blocks form these kind of triangles uh, and that these triangles line up well with these dotted red lines, which represent new sessions. And here we just define a new session as a browse session that is separated from the previous one by at least 24 hours. So Mars, you might have noticed, does not actually use time information, so there's no particular reason why it should be session aware. This means that customers must therefore be somehow browsing in a way that self-segregates their um, items into distinct groups. So my first thought would be probably that customers are simply browsing different types of items day to day. For example, one day I'm browsing sofas, and then a week later I come back, and now I want to browse dining tables, and, and maybe Mars is just learning to pick up on this difference. So let's explore this hypothesis a little further. So, so here is a real life customer's browse. Uh, there are four distinct sessions separate, separated by these uh, dotted red lines. And you can see that the first two sessions are desks. And then this customer uh, comes back later and browses two sessions of pans. And you can see that the attention weights also show this very clear split after the, sec se after the second session, once the pants browse begins. So on the face of it, this seems to confirm our previous hypothesis that customers are naturally self-delineating their browse into sessions based off the type of furniture that they are browsing. Another thing you might notice is that customers are, this customer is frequently reviewing previously viewed items. For example, you can see in the second row that this desk has been reviewed, and you can also see that this stack of pans has been reviewed. This is why I called resurfacing earlier, and it's actually a very common phenomenon, and we will, we will discuss this in greater detail later. So now let's look at this artificially constructed example to further test this hypothesis. Here I show four sleeper convertible sofas, followed by four uh, kind of best-selling sofas, followed by four outdoor sofas, which I have, which are made, made out of this jute material. So even though they are all sold under the same sofa category in at Wayfair, you can see that the outdoor sofas are treated very differently and that there's virtually no attention being paid to the first two rows for that set of uh, outdoor jute sofas. This means that Mars is simply not considering these other types of sofas to be relevant to this outdoor uh, sofa, like these outdoor sofa items, even though, again, they are all under the same sofa um, category page. To a lesser extent, you can also see that the first two rows are not as similar as well. For example, that second row of best-selling sofas also has some uh, differences, i.e. is not paying as much attention to that very first row of sleeper sofas. And this is likely because none of the best-selling sofas in that second row are sleeper sofas. Otherwise, we, we might expect to see more similarity there. However, within each group of four, i.e. each row, um, where I've deliberately picked four sofas which are similar in some way, you can see that there's high similarity. Uh, what, what this means is that Mars is learning to connect these items, but under a more specific granularity than simply because they are all sofas. Rather, it's that there are sofas that share a specific attribute, for example, uh, material or functionality. So in contrast, in the bottom half of this artificial browse, you can see many different types of furniture. You can see rugs, you can see mirrors, clocks, wall art, and bed sheets. And yet you can see that there's so much attention being paid amongst themselves. It's uh, even though they're very different furniture types, none of them are being ignored to each other. And what, what you might spot is that these different types of furniture all share one thing in common, which is that they clearly look like children's furniture. And we, we could argue whether this should constitute a style, like you know, being child, children's furniture or like location, like children's bedroom. But the point is that, uh, that Mars has learned that these different types of furniture are still very similar. Uh, so this suggests that customers are browsing, are self-delineating their browse uh, using this more abstract attribute like functionality or style, as opposed to what I said earlier of just furniture type. The, the relationship between um, this kind of, this attribute based approach and a furniture type based approach is many to many. So one type of furniture like sofas could span many different functionalities as I showed earlier. And similarly, one uh, fun functionality like being children's furniture can span many different types of furniture. 
this interpretation is not inconsistent with our previous finding because pans and desks are also very, you know, very different functionalities and are also found in very different locations in a house. So, uh, so we can still, it is still consistent with our previous finding. So here I've just switched some rows. You can see I switched the third and fourth rows. And the goal is to see what happens uh, when we interrupt the children's furniture with a row of sofas and vice versa. So as you may expect, Mars does learn to ignore the sofas and pay attention to the children's furniture of where you can see this, this kind of gap in the middle where it's learned to kind of bypass the sofas. So, and what, what this means is you know, Mars has decided that these uh, sofas are not relevant with respect to the, these final rows of children's furniture. However, the converse is not as true. You can see that the fourth row of sofas is trying to pay attention to that, the, those very first two rows of sofas, but it's been very successfully distracted by the, um, this third column of the children's furniture. This is a little harder to interpret. Um, one possibility is that people who browse children's furniture of, often also browse children, uh, sleeper sofas, but not necessarily the other way around. The, the key point here is simply to show that the most relevant, the most recent context is not necessarily the most relevant context. So as a final example, uh, if you put the more stereotypically feminine kids furniture first, like stars, unicorns, and pink colored items, and then put the more kind of traditional boys furniture like uh, your cars and farming equipment, you can see that Mars actually learns to ignore the first row of children's furniture and, uh, and has learned that there's, it's irrelevant to the more traditional boys furniture. And this is despite the fact that in both rows, the first two items are rugs and then the next two items are kind of bed sheets slash sheet sets. Um, so, so again, even though they're the same type of furniture, Mars has not connected them. However, that last row of items, the uh, dinosaur wall art and uh, the, the, the dinosaur mirror and an uh, elephant clock, these are all considered relevant to the previous row of car, rug, slash farming equipment sheets, uh, even though they're different types of furniture. And this may simply, this may simply reflect that uh, customers browse in a fairly gendered way, uh, depend, depending on whether they have a son or daughter, and that Mars is simply picking up on this behavior. This is, of course, only one data point, but it does open an interesting question, which is beyond the scope of this talk, about whether this is a learned bias in a machine learning system uh, based on how users interact with gendered items. So I've been implying now that Mars is learning which items to pay attention to based off this concept of style. So let's take a, let's take a deeper look into how this is actually being done. So here we show the learn item embeddings projected into 2D space using UMAP for coffee tables with the color maps showing various attributes like price and popularity. And I showed a very similar chart on Wednesday, but that one was for sofas. Uh, I also showed the coffee table shape as the fourth parameter here. So none of these attributes are passed in during training time, so it's learning all of these implicitly. And you can see that Mars has clearly learned to group together items of similar price or popularity and so on. Uh, but you can see, for example, that the popular, the popular items are clustered in kind of two, like on the left and right. And this is because they're not being clustered simply because they're popular, but rather because, for example, you can see it lines up with the top shape um, attribute below. It's being clustered into popular rectangular coffee tables and popular round coffee tables. Uh, because these, these attributes are all learned independently and simultaneously. So uh, Mars can learn these to weight the relative importance of these at the same time and determine which attributes are actually important to determine the next recommendation. Interestingly, you can see that these, this top shape attribute is being learned kind of on a continuum as well. For example, in the light green, you can see the square coffee tables are surrounded by a sea of the purple points, which are the rectangular coffee tables, i.e. the square tables are a subset of the rectangular tables, which we may expect in real life. And similarly, the oval tables, which are in the dark green points, are in this kind of transition zone between the yellow points, which are uh, round coffee tables, and purple points, which are rectangular coffee tables. And this also makes sense based on what we know about these shapes. So the, again, the, the fact that these, these attributes are being kind of learned on a continuum is, 
linked to what I said earlier about the rug styles being hybridized uh, in that earlier example. So here we can show some of Wafer's top ordered categories and apologies if you saw this on Wednesday already, but basically you can see that Mars is learning to group together items of the same type together. And that's what these colored clusters represent. Uh, for example, uh, down here, you can see this like tail, tail section is uh, bedding sets. Uh, it's also learning to group together items of similar types. For example, next to the bedding sets in orange are the curtains and drapes. Um, and what this means is that these types of furniture are typically commonly browsed together, and that's why Mars has learned that they are similar. In addition, you can see many areas of this chart where there are many different colors, i.e. many different types of furniture that have been clustered together via other attributes, uh, for example, style, functionality, uh, location, or, or even material. Note, for example, you can see beds are scattered in each of these categories, but they have been surrounded by items, not necessarily other beds, but other items of furniture, which you can sh sh see very clearly share some other kind of attribute like material or style. So now we know that the positional beddings help Mars learn that more recent browse is generally more relevant and that the item embeddings allow Mars to pick out specific attributes to connect relevant items. So now we can see this in action. Here I show uh, the browse above of two kind of modern metallic glam mirrors and then I changed my mind and decided to browse a Victorian mirror instead. So as before, above, you can see the attention weights being paid and um, the darker the title, the more attention is being paid. So you can see that virtually all the, of the attention in that final layer is being paid to the final item, the Victorian mirror. And you can see that the resulting recommendations are all very Victorian. You actually, there actually is one, uh, you can see one mirror does not fit in with the rest. It's this one, and that you can see is very clearly linked to that very first item. Uh, and again, this is because the browse history is so short that it, it, that Mars is not fully convinced that I've moved away from my first two items. But you can probably guess if I browse more and more Victorian mirrors, it would, this item would actually fall out of the recommendations entirely. In contrast, as I showed earlier, using matrix factorization fails to generate the correct recommendations because it's so dominated by the majority browse, which in this case are those first two mirrors, which are kind of metallic and modern. And you can see that the recommendations here are also very metallic and modern. So Mars can also learn to ignore relevant parts of a customer's browse. So for example, here I show a customer who views this glam velvet dining chair, gets sidetracked by two Victorian beds, comes back to a glam nightstand, and then gets sidetracked again by this kind of outdoor woven nightstand, and then finally returns to a glam mirror. So Mars by default will always assume that the very last item is the most relevant item, and then it will kind of hunt through the rest of the browse history to identify other relevant items uh, that are linked to that last item. So I don't know if the colors show up very clearly, but you can see that the, the items I circled are, are being basically ignored. They have very low attention weights uh, because Mars has learned that they are not relevant with respect to that final item. Even with that very first item, that glam, that velvet dining chair is so far away in the browse, it, it's still being, uh, the attributes corresponding to it are still persisting in the recommendations. For example, you can see that very first dining chair is velvet as well, and so are all these sofa racks. Uh, they are, you can see that they're all velvet as well. Uh, in addition, you can see that, for example, the, the coffee tables are all metallic, but they all have metal legs like the two items I circled above. Uh, and you can even see that the first two coffee table racks have the same kind of, they're called sled, leg, sled legs, uh, as opposed to the more standard kind of vertical legs, which correspond to that very first item as well. Of course, you can, you can also see in general, there are some vertical legs as well uh, to match that, that, uh, that circled metallic nightstand. The most interesting thing I think is that you can see even the area rugs have taken on these kind of metallic attributes. Um, you can see that they're all colored in this kind of gold and silver, i.e. I, very metallic colors, which presumably match these mirrors. Uh, this, this, is obvious, this was a little surprising to me because Obviously, area rugs do not contain metal, so there's no particular reason why this attribute should have persisted across different types of furniture. 
So now let's talk a little, about, little bit about this other part of dynamic context, which is the user intent. And I said earlier that customers like to frequently browse previous, previously viewed items uh, in order to, to determine their order. So here I show another real customers browse. So you can see customers honestly are very frequently kind of oscillating between two different items when they make their final shortlist. And you can see that the ordered items which I've circled are not necessarily the most frequently viewed item, nor than necessarily the most recently viewed item. For example, this doorknob you can see is actually not the last viewed doorknob, which is this kind of golden doorknob, but they've ordered this kind of more silver doorknob. And in con contrast, they viewed many, many round mirrors, but they actually ended up ordering this kind of more octagonal mirror. So because we know that customers like to view previous, like to order previously viewed items, this means that if we can identify which item this is that they are in fact most likely to order, then we should be trying to resurface that item because that is presumably our best recommendation. So how can we inject this into our model? So the original training pipeline for Mars, again, this is just based off Sasrec. It takes each customer's browse and then predicts each, uh, uses each subsequence to predict the next item in the sequence. Uh, you can see above, for example, is one customer's uh, browse history, which I call a training row. And I've used each subsequence to predict the next in sequence item as the target. To inject this resurfacing awareness, we tweak the training data slightly. So now we will predict the next click until we reach an item that is ordered. And the ordered item is that fourth item, which is kind of highlighted in red. And I want to note here that this is not the point I wish they order, that they, they are still browsing other, for example, here sofas. But this is, the, this is the first instance in which they view this item, which they will ultimately order uh, you know, days or you know, weeks later. So once they have viewed this item, we will kind of spam the target to be that item uh, so that it will keep trying to predict this, this as the order. If the customer has not ordered anything, we can also use add to cart as a proxy. And if they have neither, we can of course keep predicting the next viewed item as usual. As an aside, we did also try uh, directly recommending the ordered item immediately after the very first view, but it turns out that customers don't actually like this. This performed worse than simply predicting the next click, uh, presumably because customers actually do like the exploration phase and they do want to see some items that they also perhaps don't want to order so that they get a sense of what they do and do not like. So let's talk about how we uh, did the evaluation for this model. Uh, we, I showed, uh, so originally I said I use, we use next click data to evaluate, but it turned out that this actually uh, meant our A-B test would lead to customers clicking more, but because we are showing so many new items, they would just keep clicking and not actually order anything. So then we had, to, so then we decided to change our evaluation to evaluate on orders instead. Uh, so to do this, in case you missed the talk on Wednesday, I basically showed that uh, we used a variant of NDCG where we had to use a more steeper discount to account for the fact that uh, the positional effect is much stronger in our order data than NDCG otherwise would allow for. Um, we, because we have obviously so much data, we can use you know, like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers for our evaluation. So we can be very convinced that our uh, offline evaluation is correct. One note about using the historic orders for evaluation is that this is so this is kind of like a form of counterfactual evaluation, but it's slightly biased towards control because we 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 know we know exactly what the customers were shown. We can predict the in this case the mean reciprocal rank for those items, but we don't know that they would not necessarily have clicked on an item that we recommended because they were never shown that item. So what this means is that this evaluation metric is actually a little stricter than perhaps it needs to be which is not necessarily a bad thing because it means that if we can pass this offline evaluation, our online test is even more likely to succeed. So assuming our model passes the offline evaluation, we can then uh, proceed to an A-B test. And this is very straightforward. We just split half our traffic to variation and half our traffic to control. So here I can show the results. Uh, you can see that when we compare our sequential model Mars to our previous control, oh, and by the way, Control is just a um, deep neural network based off the 2016 YouTube paper. Adding the sequential information was we were able to uh, improve our conversion rate as well as our mean reciprocal rank in the offline evaluation uh, very successfully. And 
by adding the resurfacing awareness, i.e. pushing up the orders, uh, the items which were actually ordered, uh, we were able to boost our order rates by even more. So to summarize our findings, uh, we have shown that the sequential browse history is very powerful. And even just by looking at a sequence of customer views, we can glean what kind of furniture, for example, stylistically, that they are interested in. And then we can use this information to personalize other types of previously unbroused furniture. Using a transformer, we can uh, our model can react to changes in a customer's browsing preferences and identify and hence ignore the, the irrelevant parts. Uh, as an additional bonus, we can also return the attention weights, as I showed earlier, to help improve the interpretability of the model. One caveat here is obviously that uh, we cannot, it's, it, we have to kind of rely on somewhat hand wavy uh, interpretations because we can, we, we do know which items were considered most relevant, but we don't necessarily know why. We can only kind of manually look at the items and then kind of you know, guess at which attributes are actually being conserved. Uh, lastly, we also showed the importance of understanding the customer mindset, and uh, we used our knowledge of the customer consideration cycle to better inform our predictions and improve our model, for example, by boosting these previously viewed items, which we showed boosted our orders uh, by a very large amount. So thanks for your time. Um, please feel free to connect with me, and I'm happy to take questions. So we have uh, 10 minutes of uh, questions, so at least uh, if someone has a question, this is the time to ask. So we'll start from people up here. Thank you for the talk. At the beginning, you discussed uh, geo-related uh, features, but later on, you didn't mention it. Are those encoded or are those different models for different geos? Yeah, so th those geo ones are different models. Um, I don't actually work with them, so I don't know much beyond what I said earlier. Uh, but for example, so after this round, so after my model provides the recommendations, the GeoSort team will then take those items and then uh, identify their, you know, the nearest warehouse that has this item, et cetera, the you know, associated shipping cost, and then they will kind of resort my recommendations based off of this to try and uh, improve the reduce the shipping cost. And on slide 12, I think you, there is funnel embedding. Mm -hmm. uh, the third one from the left, I was it's not right. sure what, what uh, 12. Uh, Sorry, I have to go back very slowly. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. That's one. Yeah. Exactly. On this, uh, what, what would be an like, item in position? What would be the funnel embedding? In right. So the, so the funnel embedding is the, the interaction type. So whether it's a view, add car, or order. And in terms of what it does in the model, it basically, it has two main uses. The first is once a customer has ordered an item, it, the model will learn to stop recommending that item. And the second use is um, in terms of predicting what type of furniture they want to buy next. So, so not so. So our typical use case is we tell it, uh, you know, let's say this customer has browsed this, these items. Let's recommend sofas. And so we know what type of furniture they're trying to browse. If we don't know that, and we want to guess what type of furniture they, they are trying to browse, then we have to also use these funnel embeddings. Because, for example, if they've just ordered a nightstand, we know they we know to stop trying to recommend nightstands, and maybe we should recommend beds which go with this nightstand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, and the great pictures actually that you showed us really this was very intuitive to understand the model i have to say i probably take this as an example for future presentations um, uh, did you try classifying behavior users the user sessions or so like especially for the training data because i can imagine some user sessions are very like differ a lot by exposure time or so like like did you fact did you ever ex um, experiment with that like factoring in exposure time to wait maybe or yeah, so we haven't done time per se. It's, it's on our radar. Uh, one of our plans is to use like a time interval or at least time, uh, like browse time spent. Uh, because if customers accidentally click on something, then they typically immediately close it, but we've still logged it and then it will still drop in this training. Uh, um, what we, yeah, so, so we don't actually use that yet. What we have done is 
some respect to the um, some analysis with, with respect to how long the customer browse uh, in terms of how many items they browse is. So we know, for example, our model accuracy typically in, uh, increases until it reaches around 10 or so items. And after that, it kind of plateaus. Like, like put differently, if a customer has browsed you know, 10 items, we know much more about them than if they browse one item. But if they browse 60 items, we don't actually gain that much more compared to 10 items. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and one other question. Uh, thanks for those answers. Um, just um, for reference, um, how many, how much, how many bits also do you use for the embedding? How many what? Sorry. And so, so, how, so, how much storage do you use for for embeddings? Like? Oh, uh, so we so our dimensionality is uh, 120, and we have around you know, one point something million, two million items. So overall, in, including the model weights, I think the model is just under one gigabyte. Okay. Uh, you use float 32 everything or sorry is everything float 32 uh, yes yeah. yes okay thank you so we have uh, another kind of questions in the zoom um, and one question is about mentioning that uh, different wafer stores and categories have different length of customer consideration cycles so how do you account for this if at all in your uh, transformer model so originally we tried to train uh, one model per type of furniture. So then it would kind of organically learn these differences. Like for example, that you know people do not spend much time personalizing you know, patio furniture, et cetera. Uh, but this actually did not perform as well as training one model for all types of furniture simultaneously. And I think the, the, main, the main cause I think was actually just because uh, the data was not similarly dense in all like I, I we sell a lot more rugs than we do you know outdoor like dining chairs and so the the quality of the learn embeddings especially for the position were not as high for the smaller types of furniture so that's why we transitioned to this one big model uh, i so in so we don't account for so our model will not is not uh, type specific in terms of in terms of knowing uh, what type of furniture is being passed in and therefore, you know, deciding when to resurface versus when not to resurface. Uh, however, the, I, I think the model can learn this behavior nevertheless because the item embeddings are, uh, as I showed earlier, they, they do, it does learn this class, sorry, this category component. So it does learn which type of furniture an item is, even though we don't tell it this up front. And, uh, be, and using these weights, I think it can still uh, kind of decide how many items uh, before it should start resurfacing more and more of them. Thank you. So another question is about the item embeddings, how they've been extracted. Does they have any kind of um, images also incorporated into the extraction of those embeddings? So which kind of features are basically um, input for the item embedding. Mm -hmm. so, so these item embeddings are actually entirely trained on customer item interaction. There's no other information used. It's literally a, like a list of strings. Um, and then these everything else is learned. Uh, we, we don't use, so we could use images. Images are obviously a great source of information like style. The main reason we don't is because we want to make inference very, very fast. So, uh, so for example, this model we use in production and it, it takes the inference time is typically, I think, 50 to 100 milliseconds, uh, which we wouldn't be able to do if we also had to pull in items or like a large item embedding, sorry, image embedding, sorry, to uh, to uh, pass in as well. But we could, we could, that's true. Great, thank you. So another uh, question that I have is regarding to the style of the user. How dynamic is really the style of the user? How it's being changed for like in weeks or months have you tried to first understand how dynamic is this kind of style of the user? And also um, another question that is related to that is the interpretation of the model. Um, did you try, uh, we all know that neural networks are like kind of a black box and we cannot really understand the context kind of component in the model, whereas mostly it's implicit. So did you try to, um, have some kind of explanation or interpretation of the model just to understand the context or how dynamic, for example, is the style of the user. Mm. So, I mean, so the slides I showed with the kind of style transfer, let me scroll like 
here, for example, like this kind of, I guess, is what you're asking. So we haven't specifically looked at how often or how uh, how long it takes before customers change styles. Uh, it's a good question, actually. I, I think I'll look into this uh, next week, I guess. Um, one, like we've kind of always assumed that when customers rapidly change style, it's because someone else is borrowing their account or they kind of made a mistake. So we haven't really looked into, like we haven't considered it to be kind of deliberate uh, per se. Though, as I do, to be fair, I, I did show with the rug example earlier that if customers are kind of hovering between two different styles, like Mars can learn to kind of average them and then show like a fitting recommendation on that part. Uh, the second part of your question, on, on interpretability. So that's a good question. So the attention weights kind of do this, I guess. Um, we have, like, I, we, I, I debate whether we should, whether this should be like a customer facing feature. Uh, for example, you know, we can be like, you know, we are showing you these recs because of, you know, ABC, and then they could presumably toggle, you know, get rid of them if they're like, actually, you know, I don't want, I don't want this one anymore. And then you can, we can kind of zero out that weight. And then this would obviously change the recommendations. I don't know if it's a good idea to expose that to the customer, um, but it would be a good way to kind of incorporate the customer feedback very, very explicitly into the recommendations. And another, thank you. And another last question related to that is, do you incorporate explicit features of context to your model? For example, you said that you only use the like sequential kind of items, but not using, for example, the timestamp. So, the question is, which kind of features, if any, do you use in, in in your models to incorporate like contextual information? And if you're not doing that, if you have intuition, why? Right. So, so we do. Uh, we are planning on adding the time interval, uh, type, the time stamp to the our next iteration of the model. We just we didn't do it yet for various uh, production reasons. Mainly it's because if you want to use that time stamp information at inference, then you have to. Uh, we have to store the um, the feature, the item names, as well as their timestamps, as well as their interaction types. And because we store clicks and add to carts and orders in different tables, you then have to do like a sorting out mechanism, which makes inference much slower. But but it is it is on the radar. It's, uh, we do want to use that. Otherwise, I would say I guess the only contextual feature that we explicitly use is it's not really a feature. It's like the the location in the sense that we train a different model for each location. But I, I guess that's not really a feature per se. Thank you. Any other questions? Hey, thanks for a great talk and really a great piece of work. Uh, I was curious about the uh, the quality of the item embeddings that you learned. They, they obviously work and produce some, some nice embeddings, but do you have any like offline metric to evaluate the quality of the embeddings? Uh, not a metric per se, I guess. So one one thing you might actually have noticed. Let me scroll back to this. Is you might have spotted the the popular items tend to be more on the outsides, and this is not a coincidence. Um, it, and this was the case yes on my on my talk on Wednesday as well. It's I think it's because these embeddings are updated more frequently, so they end up being larger. Um, so put differently, the the magnitude of the embedding, if you just calculate like the L1 norm, L2 norm, is actually uh, is actually heavily dependent on how frequently that item is is uh, occurs in training. So what that means is that the items which are less popular actually kind of suffer, and they kind of all hover around the origin in terms of and and those items I would say are poor quality embeddings. Um, so so we are, we are thinking of various ways. I, I guess you know many companies have this problem. We're thinking of many various ways. For example, using you know content features to try and improve these. Uh, but right, it, as you point out, it is um, the quality does depend on how frequently the item is viewed. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and another question. You said that if a user uh, did not purchase anything, you could use add to carts as a proxy for that in the resurfacing resurfacing mm -hmm. uh, sampling. Can you elaborate a little bit what you meant by that? I didn't fully understand. Right, so basically just if they have not ordered, but they did at least add to cart, then we can use the add to cart as the target. Um, uh, like once they add to cart some item, if, even if they never ordered it, maybe it's because they found it somewhere else. Uh, and then we will kind of use that as if they had ordered it. All right, because in, in that case you would have uh, since that cards, I assume, are more, or they have to be more common than purchases, then your data set would be filled with more of these sort of proxy resurfacing than the actual purchase resurfacing. But maybe that's fine. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's true. So we, we haven't played too much with the ratio of orders to not orders. So typically, let's say 3% of our customers will order something. 
Um, so it is not a large chunk of our data set. And we are thinking of maybe you know, oversampling these ones so that we will you know, force it to you know, resurface even more and more. But obviously the danger of that is we don't want to just end up becoming a, like a resurfacing machine, right? Because then all you end up doing is showing previously viewed items and then the rest of your catalog never gets exposed. All right, thank you so much. So let's uh, thank again, uh, Jeffrey, for your like great presentation. I think we can all learn first about the wafer and how contextual information is being used. But also, I think the presentation was really like amazing and inspiring for every one of us. Uh, also, visualizing how to visualize embeddings, neural nets, and how like they are important in your domain. So thank you again. Let's thank uh, the keynote speaker. And uh, the next presenter can uh, come and uh, present uh, the next work, which is uh, unsupervised graph embeddings for session based recommendations with item features. Andreas. I'm sorry, I know I'm sorry. This was better. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It works. Talk to the mic. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for the possibility to present my work here. So today I'm going to talk about unsupervised graph embeddings for session-based recommendation with item features. My name is Andreas Beintner and this work was a joint work with Marta Moscati, Emilia Varada Caballero, Marco Schedel and Eva Zangerle. So to start with, I want to show you uh, an example user interaction uh, with a system and it's clear to see that there is a certain global context uh, in these interactions and the items are related to each other in some sense. So in this example the user um, wants to organize a holiday or vacation for himself and books a flight, uh, stay in a hotel and rents a car and possibly as a next step he wants to book tickets for a tourist attraction uh, in his destination. So to capture such specific intents, we have sequential recommendation systems or sequential recommender systems. Uh, so let's compare them first with a general recommender system to have a better understanding of them. So uh, a general recommender system does not consider the uh, dynamic uh, or the sequential dependence of items and he uh, or the recommender system or the general recommender system models the user item interactions in a static way instead of a more dynamic way and so this disables the general recommender system from modeling the current user preference and it's only able to capture the general preference of a user. And on the other hand, we have sequential recommender systems, which emphasize the dynamic in the interaction sequence and explicitly model the sequential context. So uh, they use the sequential dependencies in the interaction sequence or in the session to, to capture the current preference of a user and to provide more accurate recommendations to the user. So sequential recommend or sequential recommender systems can be also seen as kind of a subset or a special case of, special case of 
context that I recommend a system since the sequence itself in a session implicitly introduces some context. As current sequential recommender systems or methods mainly focus on the extraction of sequential patterns from the session and do not make use uh, of additional item features. So as part of this presentation, we want to propose an approach uh, which focuses on the extraction of useful item site information in an unsupervised manner and to uh, explicitly uh, provide them as an input to sequential recommendation methods. So as in this work, we specifically focus on the task of session based recommendation. So due to data privacy regulations or other factors can lead to the state where no user information is available and the sessions are completely anonymous. And sessions, session based recommender system then aim to predict the next item the user will interact with only based on the preceding items in the current session and without any additional use of information which is not available. Um, current approaches in the area of session based recommendation can be divided roughly into two groups. First, we have the nearest neighbor based methods where conceptually the idea is to find past, session, uh, past sessions that contain the same elements as the ongoing session. And the recommendations are then based on selecting items that appear in the most similar past session. Uh, how, so there are different techniques to refine this procedure by taking the recency, the popularity, or the position of items into account. However, none of the nearest neighbor-based methods uh, try to incorporate, incorporate item features into the process of finding similar sessions. Uh, in the last years, more and more deep learning-based approaches uh, were introduced in this area. So in the early days, we had the recurrent neural networks and the convolutional neural networks to tackle this, car, this task. Then more and more, uh, attention and self-attention models uh, were introduced and most recently the graph neural networks as it's possible to model a session as a graph showed to, to reach current state-of-the-art performance uh, in session-based recommendation. Yeah, so it is shown that item features can improve the performance of recommender systems and especially session-based recommendation, where no user features are available, as we already have heard. Uh, current models in session-based recommendation, which incorporate item feature, features, usually add an additional branch to an already existing baseline model uh, to make use of such item features. But to the best of our knowledge, none of them is currently graph-based. So, in this work, we propose a pre-training scheme which learns the item embeddings in an unsupervised way with a graph neural network. And so this method effectively adopts the item features, item features to be used in any sequential model. And our approach can be plugged in in any model, so be it nearest neighbor or uh, neural network based and is therefore full, fully model agnostic. Here we can see an overview about uh, of our proposed approach. So we name it Graph Convolution Network Extension, or short GC Next. And first, uh, the first component uh, or the first stage of this approach would be the item co-occurrence graph, where we generate an item to item graph by extracting the item co-occurrences from sessions. And then we apply an unsupervised learning method to extract uh, the node representations. And we subsequently use these embeddings to initialize the embedding table of the underlying sequential, or in this case, a neural network model. I will explain later on how we use it in nearest neighbor methods, but in this case, it's a neural network based model. So we use the unsupervised graph embeddings to initialize the item embedding table 
and the sequential model then learns the task of session-based recommendation in an end-to-end -end matter. So looking into the first component, the item co-occurrence graph, as I already have told you, we generate the item to item graph by extracting item co-occurrences from sessions. So each node in this graph corresponds to an item in a session and has its item features as descriptors. And there exists an undirected edge between uh, two nodes if the items co-occur in the same session and each, each edge has a weight attached to it, uh, which is the number of co-occurrences. So in this example, we can see that there is an edge between node two and node three, and the edge weight is three since um, both items co-occur multiple times in the same session. To learn the item representations in an unsupervised manner, we rely on the bootstrap graph latency learning method by Taco et al. And in this method, two different views uh, are produced from one graph by adopting simple augmentations like dropping edges of uh, node feature masking. Uh, the two graphs are then inputted into two encoders, which produce uh, the online node embeddings and the target node embeddings. And uh, Online node embeddings are then input to a predictor, which forms uh, or which tries to predict uh, the target node embeddings. And finally, the cosine similarity uh, between the uh, output of the predictor and the target node embedding is the final objective for the optimization of this unsupervised learning method. So. <clears throat> This procedure allows to learn the node embeddings fully unsupervised and has no need for contrasting with uh, computational expensive negative samples. For the, or for, for the two encoders in this case, uh, we use a custom architecture. We rely on an optimized variant of the convolutional layer of the graph attention networks and to stack multiple convolutional layers uh, we use skip connections uh, in combination with the pre-low activation function. So lastly, in our pipeline, the question is how do we use the learned uh, graph embeddings or node embeddings in the uh, sequential model or in the sequential baseline model. So uh, instead of initializing the neural-based sequential model, item embedding table with a sophisticated initialization method like Xavier initialization or other variants, we directly adopt the learned item embeddings to initialize this embedding table. And thereby the GC Next framework improves the learning process of the underlying sequential model as these embeddings have some topological knowledge about the item to item relations and they have some additional item feature information. In contrast to neural network methods or models, uh, the nearest neighbor methods do not make use of an item embedding table. So they find similar sessions based on the input sequence to predict the next candidate item. And to use GC next in the nearest neighbor methods, we propose to use the item graph embeddings to find session neighbors. So we compute the cosine similarity or the similarity of the sessions based on the cosine distance uh, of the embedding of each item in the input session to each item in the candidate session. And additionally, we adopt a threshold value on the distance to find similar embeddings. Uh, the candidate sessions are then scored by their corresponding position mapping or again by the cause and similarity as we show in equation one. So to evaluate our GC next uh, pre training scheme or framework, we conduct experiments on three widely used data sets from different domains. So the Digenetica data set and the Dmol data set are from the e commerce domain. And additionally, we conduct experiments on the music for all data set, which is from the music domain. And we enrich this data set with so-called I-vectors, 
uh, which describe certain musical features and we did that to have more additional site information available for this uh, data set. So coming to the results, for the nearest neighbor methods, we decided to use SKNN, STAN, VSKNN and VSTAN as representative models or methods. And we can see that when we use GC next in these nearest neighbor methods, we observe some significant uh, performance increasement. Uh, in particular, for the VSKNN model, uh, we, can saw, we can see a large improvement. So, for instance, on the uh, on all data sets, that the hit rate at ten score is increased by one to six percentages, uh, where the six uh, percentage performance increasement is uh, marked red. But also, uh, we need to mention that although some of these methods are able to keep up with the neural network models, uh, they cannot reach state of the art performance. So our approach uh, shows a significant improvement on the neural network based models. So in this case, we decided to use Kruferec, Kesa, Stamp, NAM, and SASREC as representative methods of the neural based methods in session based recommendation. And Kesa, which, is, uh, which uses convolutional sequence embeddings, and Stamp, which is a, a fully attention based um, model or method. Uh, have the biggest advantage when they are extended with GC next. So on STEM, for instance, uh, ex the extension on the DMAR data set with GC next brings about a performance increase of about 21% indicated uh, with the red markers and also indicated with the blue markers, the groove for rec on the music for data set also uh, has a large performance improvement. The SASTREC model extended with GC Next uh, shows state of the art performance on the Digenetica, Digenetica data set on all metrics and also on the other data set. It mostly outperforms the other models. For further comparison, uh, we also included uh, some experiments with models which additionally incorporate item features. So we have Grooferec F and FTSA. And in addition to that, we also compared it with current uh, graph-based methods like SRGNN, GCSUN, and LightGCN. And we also extended those methods to incorporate, incorporate item features. Uh, so we in initialized their item embedding tables with the item features directly to have a, a fair comparison to our approach. We can see that SASREC is able, as a SASREC extended with GC Next, is able to outperform uh, all of the feature based models and most of the graph based models. And or just on the music for all data set, uh, the GC Sun extended uh, with the item features uh, reaches a higher MRL score, but the uh, SASREC has a higher hit rate score compared to GC Sun F. Finally, I want to show you the, the, the training performance uh, of different models uh, with the corresponding co uh, baseline counterpart. So when we extend models with GC Next, we can see that already in the first epochs, the model is able to uh, have some reasonable performance. And we think it's due to the enriched information, which is contained in the item. So to summarize, uh, we presented an extension to sequential recommendation models uh, by using a, a two-stage pipeline where we first uh, create an item-to-item -item or item co-occurrence graph. Then we use the unsupervised learning method to extract uh, the corresponding node embeddings. And we show that it's fully model agnostic by uh, extending the nearest neighbor methods as well as neural network-based models. And in our experiments, we show that we can significantly improve uh, the baseline models uh, on three different data sets. For future work, we, we plan to investigate uh, the effect on the graph embeddings uh, for items in a code start scenario, if there is any improvement or if it can help uh, in this scenario. And we also want to investigate uh, the diverging impact on the different baseline models. So why 
uh, on some neural network based models the performance uh, improvement was not that big as expected. So thank you very much for your attention and if you have any questions feel free to ask. There is one question online about um, the scaling of um, the uh, method. Um, what is the time complexity of your me method? Does, does it scale to data sets with millions of items? Yeah, so um, for, for the scaling part, we, one reason we decided to use the BGRL method is because it's specifically designed to scale on large data sets. And additionally, we used the sampling technique to, to not have the, the need to use the whole graph, but to use just a, a certain amount of neighbors to, to make the updates. So uh, a large set of items shouldn't be a problem here to, to make usage of this extension. Thank you. Another last question, because we don't have a lot of time. Do you, did you also evaluate some models when initialized with item embeddings that are learned via another kind of methods like uh, matrix factorization, for example. So did you use any other kind of um, other methods for extracting these item embeddings? No, but it would be a good idea for, for some future work improvements or for, for further comparison to other models. Right. So thank you again for your presentation. So I would like to invite the next uh, speaker for a presentation about the long tail of context. Does it exist and matter? So Constantine, good luck. All right. Do you, see, do you see the the right screen, Masha? In Zoom. Perfect. All right. So my name is Konstantin Bauman. I'm presenting our joint work with Alexey Vasiliev and Alexander Tujilin, which is called "The Long Tail of Context: Does It Exist and Matter?" No need to explain what is context and how it works in this audience. So the standard approach to work uh, with the context in recommend the system is called representational approach. Representational approach assumes that uh, all contextual variables in an application are known uh, in advance and uh, with all their structures and with all their values. Uh, so here in the table, I have some examples of uh, very popular um, applications that are used in context where recommend the systems. So for example, tourist guide, the standard uh, list of contextual variables include time uh, of the travel, location, weather, and traffic. For movies, researchers traditionally use time, place, and the company. For the restaurants, for example, in the bottom, it's time, location, company, and occasion of your visit to the restaurant. So in each of those research papers, uh, authors usually select those contextual variables and uh, implement some new models which uh, help to provide better recommendations. But besides those um, applications, there exists context-rich applications where uh, the variety of context is much bigger than like two, three or, uh, contextual variables, and where the manual selection of contextual variables could not be sufficient. So, for example, in the dialogue system where the customer service representative calls customers and talk about the uh, products and opportunities and the problems and everything, uh, there could be lots of interesting contextual uh, variables extracted from those uh, dialogues. So, customer may share lots of important information about their current context. So, in this, this paper, uh, in this work, we worked with uh, such dialogue uh, system in the banking application and extracted over 200 different contextual variables. So the research problem that we are focusing on, so first of all we focus on those context-rich applications. We study the long tail of contexts. 
So if you have lots of different contextual variables, there are some important contextual variables and uh, there are lots of uh, other contextual variables which appear really infrequently. So they form long tail of context. So the research question that we're trying to address is what we put in the title of our paper. It's the long tail of context. Does it exist and matter? So meaning like uh, if we have the long tail of context, would it uh, using it in our recommendation algorithms, would it help us to provide better recommendations at the end? So our approach uh, to address this problem is to extract contextual variables discussed in dialogues uh, with customers. And then we analyze the effect of long tail of context on recommendation performance. I will start with a description of the data set that we used. We used the dialogues, as I said, so we took the transcribed dialogues. So we used the text uh, of the dialogues between the call center managers of a large European bank with its commercial clients. So call center managers, they call their clients and offer some products. And um, then they discuss the products. And then at the end of this dialogue, uh, manager stores wrote down the outcome of this dialogue, uh, meaning that um, like if the customer expressed their uh, willingness to uh, purchase the product or service. So we call it propensity to purchase. So here is it. it's the outcome of the dialogue. We collected the dialogues uh, between July and September 2021, last year. Uh, after pre-processing, we ended up with uh, 247,000 of clean dialogues. In those dialogues, we have lines uh, made by clients and by managers. We're mostly interested in the lines in those dialogues made by clients. Uh, on average, in each dialogue, we have 38.8 uh, client lines and the length of those lines is uh, on average 11 words. In our uh, analysis, we used four banking products. First one is a uh, business banking account. Um, so customer can open an account in the bank. Acquiring service is the service when the bank uh, processes uh, payments uh, for the company. And then salary service when the bank uh, manages salaries for all the employees in the company. And finally, the leasing service. So here is the summary of our data. We had um, 120,000 of dialogues discussing the business banking account, uh, 50, more than 50,000 of dialogues describing acquiring service and salary service, and around 5,000 dialogues describing the leasing service. All right, now we have the dialogues for this product, and we need to extract the context from the text of the dialogue. In order to extract the context from those texts, we applied the method from our previous paper, which was published this uh, spring. So in that paper, we developed a context parsing method, which uh, extracts contextual information from user reviews. So the idea of this method is to process uh, user reviews and extract whatever contextual variable appear there and then mark uh, them in those reviews. So it consists of five, five stages. We first generate the long list of uh, syntactic phrases, which could be potential candidates for uh, contextual phrases describing some contextual information in an application. Then we developed some filters, which significantly reduce the uh, number of those potential candidates. Then we sort the phrases based on several statistics, which will also develop. And then we um, present the uh, list of um, contextual uh, phrases uh, for final inspection for the domain expert. Once the domain expert um, approves those contextual variables, those phrases, we generate contextual variables and then mark their appearance in uh in user reviews so each reviews uh, each review would be enriched with the value of contextual variables that appear in them so we adapted this process to the um, application with the dialogues with customers we start with transcribed text of dialogues 
And as I said, consider only customer's line. So what customer said, because customer shared their contextual information. Uh, and uh, then we do the first step, generate the initial set of syntactic phrases and uh, do the initial filters. They are like very simple. We select uh, the most uh, frequent uh, phrases, which appear in at least 50 dialogues, and uh, those phrases which significantly affect the uh, customer's propensity to purchase for at least one of the considered products. So we just compare the average propensity to purchase a product uh, between the group of dialects containing a phrase and other dialects. And if there is a statistically significant difference, we select this phrase for subsequent analysis. Then we uh, use the BERT model to uh, construct uh, embeddings uh, of those phrases. Uh, we apply PC to compress the embedding space, and uh, finally, we apply the clustering approach, dbscan, to group those uh, potential candidates for contextual phrases into our clusters. So now we have those clusters. In each cluster, we have phrases which are very similar, and uh, we need to do like the final. Uh, so we produced 1,000 clusters. Uh, and we we do the next filtering. So we calculate certain statistics and use these statistics to uh, reduce the number of those selected clusters. So the list of statistics include the average customer's propensity rate. So how important this phrase for the customer decision. Uh, another statistic is the average position of phrase in the dialogue. In our paper about reviews, we found that contextual information is mostly appear at the beginning of the reviews. So customer, first of all, describes the context and then goes to their experience. In the dialogue, we observe this similar pattern. So customers, they mostly talk about the contextual information at the beginning of their dialogues. So we use the statistic about phrases to identify um, contextual phrases in an application. And then we do the final uh, selection using three domain experts uh, in the banking domain, and they selected and approved 216 contextual uh, clusters representing contextual information in this application. Once we got these contextual clusters, we parse dialogues and marked values of those contextual variables in them. So here are some examples of contextual variables that we extracted in our application. So customer company is growing and they are about to open a new store. It's an important information which affects their decision about our suggested products. Customer company is about to hire new employees. Customer debit card is about to expire. They have an account in a different bank. And there are lots and lots of different interesting contextual variables um, that can be used to provide better recommendation of products in this dialogue systems. All right, so we extracted the context. Now we developed the context aware recommendation models. So we recommend financial services to customers. We use the data about the customers. Um, what do we know about the customers? In that uh, financial institution, we know like, information about their transactions. So we create embeddings of customer transactional data. And we use the contextual information extracted from the previous dialogues, as I explained before. OK, and now, in order to provide context-aware recommendations of products to customers, we need to predict, for each product, we, we predict their propensity to purchase that product. So in this uh, work, we use the classification models. We tried five different classification models, including logistic regression, random forest, light GBM, factorization machine, and auto ML. So next, we use all these things to evaluate. Uh, slide does not switch. Okay, so um, then we use all this stuff to uh, evaluate the importance of long tail of context. So we do it in two steps. 
First of all, we take all the contextual variables that we extracted in this application and sort them based on their importance. So we use two approaches to sort them. First approach is uh, based on their uh, frequency. So we calculate how many dialogues contain phrases from each of the uh, clusters. And then uh, another approach is based on their propensity to purchase. Average propensity to purchase uh, for the clusters, for the dialogues containing phrases from the cluster. So we sort them and uh, we get such plots. So this plot shows the um, frequency distribution for our contextual uh, clusters uh, for the business bank account. So we can see that there are a few uh, contextual clusters uh, which appear in many dialogues and we have a long tail uh, of uh, contextual clusters which appear in very few uh, dialogues. So this uh, forms uh, the long tail of context. And we observe the same picture for all the considered products. So we created this um, a long uh, tail of context. And now we would like to evaluate uh, the contribution of this long tail of context to their recommendation performance. In order to do this, uh, we take uh, from the head of this distribution, uh, we take progressively larger sets of contextual variables and use them to train our recommendation models. So we take top 10 most important, uh, top 10 percent of most important clusters, top 20, top 30, and so on. And we go up to 100. So we did that, we trained our model, and here are the results. This uh, result uh, for the um, business banking account product. Uh, on the x-axis, we see the percent of uh, context used for training. We start from zero, no context, then 10, 20, and up to 100. On the y-axis, we have F1 measure. So the quality of the uh, prediction of um, customer's propensity to purchase. As we can see, there is a huge step between the zero, no context, to 10%. So uh, when we start using context in this application, we get a big boost in the quality of the provided recommendations. But then we observe that uh, once we uh, take progressively more uh, contextual variables into account, we uh, build better model and the quality of the provided recommendation um, grows. So we observe the same pictures for other evaluation measures. This plot is for the same product for the AUC evaluation measure. And we see the same results for other products as well. So these are the same results in, um, just in a table format. Here we uh, compare the columns uh, with the no context or condition performance with no context. Then uh, performance with the, when we use 10% and the right column shows the recommendation performance when we use 100% of contextual variables extracted in this application. Uh, as I said before, we see that there is a, a big improvement uh, from 5 to 10% when we use top 10% most important contextual variables. But once we uh, include all the uh, contextual information uh, extracted in this application, uh, we uh, get the improvement up to like 25 or 30 percent in the recommendation quality. And just the final slide, in conclusion, uh, in this paper we study context-rich recommender system applications. We demonstrate that um, these variables uh, form the long tail of context and uh, that this uh, long tail of context matters. We played with, experimented with dialogues about banking products. We extracted 216 different contextual variables. We showed that performance improvement of long tail of context ranges between 8 and 29% if we compare to only top 10 most important contextual variables and our results are consistent across all the banking uh, products that we considered, five different classification uh, models, and two types of sorting of contextual variables. So as a result, we demonstrated that uh, the importance of leveraging full contextual information that you can extract in an application, 
as opposed to focusing only a few contextual variables as is done in most of the research papers. Thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Kostya. Any questions? There are no questions. I will ask about. Do, do we have anything in chat? Uh, not. No. Okay. Um, regarding to you, you showed us that adding more features would increase the performance of the model. Did you have any kind of situation where there was a decrease when you add more and more features? Because basically, as we all know, the more context, the more dimensions, maybe the more noise to the model. So have you seen any kind of decreasing phenomenon and not increasing when you add more features? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> So let me elaborate. So we haven't seen um, such uh, such effects, uh, maybe because we experimented with only like adding 10%. 10% is a sufficient number mm -hmm. of features. It's 20 uh, contextual variables. And uh, maybe some of them, you know, are not super efficient and add noise, but then uh, this effect might be uh, like removed by adding another 19. If we like, go deeper and add one feature one by one instead of these plots we will see like much noisy plots mm -hmm. i suppose so yeah but uh the idea is to show like the general trend that uh the quality still grows and even if we uh consider the long tail of context after adding like 80 percent and going to 100 we still get a performance improvement Thank you. Another question that I have is regarding the interpretation of which kind of features really influence the prediction. Did you see any kind of phenomenon of like those kind of features, contextual features help much more than the others? Did you try to interpret those kind of uh, contextual features? Uh, we did not focus on the interpretation itself. Uh, and uh, so here we used all the contextual variables uh, for four considered products. Obviously, they work slightly different for different products. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what to say about interpretation because we did not look at in this direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, let's take the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have time. I'm sorry for. We can take the the question offline. Um, so the next presentation online um, by Alexander and it's MTA, MTS Skyon Implicit Contextualized Sequential Dataset for Movie Recommendation. Um, so basically, the last um, presentation is a dataset that is public to the community on context aware recommendation. Uh, recommendation, whereas the other kind of papers were more models uh, based on context aware. So, Alexander, you can start. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. I hope you can see myself and you can see my screen as well. Yeah, uh, we can see you. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Alexander Petrov. I'm a PhD student at uh, the University of Glasgow. And this is a joint work with uh, Ildar Safila from MTS and Darat Ikanovich from MTS and uh, Dmitry Ignata from Higher School of Economics. So first of all, I just um, uh, want to uh, say that uh, this presentation uh, was supposed to be presented by Ildar. And unfortunately, Ildar got sick today. So you have me uh, and I wish Ildar um, swift recovery and also like uh, take in mind that it is 1 a.m. Uh, here in Glasgow, uh, so uh, I hope you will forgive uh, me for some small uh, <laughs> pr uh, small issues that I can have. But nevertheless, I'll do my best to present this work. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with a question. Uh, why do we need another data set for uh, movie recommendation? Because uh, uh, in general, there are some 
um, data sets. Uh, some of them are quite popular in the world of recommender systems. But nevertheless, uh, we argue that uh, there are some problems. Uh, first of all, in the available data sets, um, there's like some lack of contextual features, uh, lack of uh, features um, about users and items and also these uh, data sets are uh, somewhat uh, artificial and we will talk about that uh, in future uh, so in, in like in more details in later slides uh, but uh, for now we kind of uh, can say that uh, there is some demand in a more uh, real world uh, type of uh, the movie recommendation data set so yeah here we are with uh Kion uh data set uh and uh on this slide we we give a very brief comparison uh between Kion and uh other popular uh data sets such as Netflix and movie lens um Again, uh, we will talk about details more later, uh, but uh, the main idea is that uh, Kion dataset has implicit interactions data, uh, whereas other datasets have only uh, ratings data which uh, are explicit and uh, they uh, don't have to be collected at the time of uh, watch. And uh, moreover, they probably are kind of quite frequently collected a long time after the watch, whereas in our data set, uh, the data was uh, collected exactly when the interaction happened. Uh, we also uh, have uh, user demographic features. We have uh, quite a rich um, uh, and diverse uh, features about items. And we also have uh, inter uh, contextual features such as like uh, uh, watch duration and percentage of total watch of the movie. Uh, another uh, important feature that we have in the data set, it is like uh, very well represents uh, time trends of that kind of can frequently be observed in uh, real world uh, data sets. So here we have two plots uh, that uh, illustrate a couple of these uh, trends that you can see in uh, the data set. Uh, the left hand side plot shows uh, spikes of popularity of uh, certain items and these spikes of popularity are due to uh, for example release date uh, as soon as the for example a new episode of a popular tv show is released it obviously gets a very uh, high spike of popularity and then over time it goes down uh, another um important uh, uh, kind of property of the data set is that um, the data set represents the growth of the platform itself. It basically uh, contains uh, the, uh, the data that was collected uh, shortly after launch of the platform. Uh, almost up until to 1 million of users uh, of active audience. So you can see that uh, uh, each next week in the data set uh, has more and more interactions. And uh, this is another uh, quite interesting property of uh, the yeah. data sets. And because of that, we obviously have uh, lots of uh, users that don't have uh, that much interactions in their history. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a typical problem uh, in the real world. And specifically, this is a problem for uh, fastly growing uh, online platforms such as Kion. Uh, we have uh, both uh, interaction data about like users and items. And uh, for both users and items, we have uh, uh, some like uh, 
features presented. And as you, as you see uh, in the uh, slide, uh, for a uh, vast majority of uh, items, we have both uh, features and interactions. Uh, there are very few items where we have only features but no interactions. Uh, however, uh, in uh, the like for, for the users, uh, we also like uh, um, for vast majority of users, we have both uh, interactions and features. However, there's like uh, quite um, large proportion of users who have only interactions or only features. And this is an important uh, property of data sets that we have uh, kind of uh, quite a, a large amount of cold start users uh, that uh, we somehow have to deal with. A uh, little bit more details on comparison with um, existing movie data sets. Uh, this table uh, contains uh, quantitative characteristics uh, of Q1 in comparison uh, to Netflix and the large, largest uh, of the movie lens family, uh, namely movie lens 25 million. As we can see, uh, Q1 has uh, substantially more users. Uh, the amount of items is comparable to uh, Netflix data sets. Data set, however, uh, it is a lower than movie lens. Uh, it has uh, low, uh, less interactions. However, as I said, it is like um, uh, most of the interactions of the users of Qon collected over almost uh, six or seven months. And that leads to a much shorter average sequence length of the interactions. So, uh, for example, in Netflix, we have 209 uh, uh, interactions per user on average. In Qon, we have just five and six. Um, so, uh, partially, this is because uh, Qon, uh, again, was collected from real world uh, uh, movie platform, whereas uh, movie lens uh, was collected uh, from uh, from uh, the kind of uh, ratings platform, and Netflix was collected from Netflix. But both Netflix and movie lens have artificial uh, artificial lim limitation of on number of interactions, so they don't include users with a number of interactions with less than some specific number of um, number of interactions. Uh, but we would argue that uh, even more important difference uh, is on the qualitative characteristics. As we can see, both Netflix and MovieLens are explicit data sets. So basically, this is ratings data sets uh, that were collected uh, during the, not during the watch, but like sometime after watching the movie, whereas in Q1, uh, the data was collected at watching time. It also has more data about the interaction itself. We have a duration and watch a percentage. Uh, it also has some uh, user features, uh, such as age, uh, income band, and whether or not the user has kids. And this, uh, from our point of view, can be useful for uh, fairness, uh, for example, research, which becomes more and more popular these days. And we, as we also can see, we have uh, much more uh, uh, side information about movies. So we have type and title and gender and so on and so forth. So it's like more, more rich and we hope it can be used in more interesting research. Uh, we use this um, data set, like when I say we, this is more uh, relates to Ildar uh, for the online competition. And I personally participated in this competition as a contestant. Uh, this was, uh, I would say, uh, reasonable size uh, competition with uh, 46 uh, participants submitting their, their solutions. And there were 844 overall solutions. Uh, the competition was uh, conducted uh, using 
a mean average precision at 10 as a main metric. Uh, and this metric was computed on the closed part of the data set. And this table on the slide represents top five uh, results uh, and the type of their solution. As we can see, all solutions uh, in top five are based on some form of ensembling. Uh, top two solutions, including my personal solution, are based on uh, ensembling of Nero and non-Nero methods where our uh, solutions number three, four, and five are ever based just on uh, gradient boosting trees or like uh, non-neural ensemble methods. Uh, a little bit more details on the uh, two winning solutions, uh, one of which was my personal solution. Uh, and uh, apparently uh, top winning solutions were quite similar to each other. Uh, both of them used a um, two-stage approach. Uh, and at the first stage, we have several uh, neural and non-neural uh, methods uh, that were uh, generating features and selecting candidates. Uh, for example, as neural uh, approaches, uh, there we used uh, such popular uh, models like Bertfrek and Kaiser or Sazrek. And then uh, these uh, uh, these uh, kind of results from these first stage models and uh, additional features we were passed to the second stage model. In my case. Uh, uh, it was like GPN in the case of the VDNIC model, it was cut boost. Uh, they were also quite similar, both are based on credit moves and trees. And uh, this was the method that allowed to uh, achieve the best result. And uh, from my personal um, um, experience, I can say that uh, ensembling uh, through uh, second stage was important. I tried uh, only like solar models based on neural methods, and they worked um, significantly worse compared to ensemble using light like GPN. Uh, here are some of the features uh, that uh, our contestants used uh, to improve their solutions. And um, as we can see, they were quite uh, significant. Uh, uh, amount of uh, features that we can describe as contextual features. Uh, for example, uh, users, uh, 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 features that improved uh, the results were uh, like proportion of men among the uh, movie viewers, of proportion of young audience. Uh, some uh, contestants uh, improved results using item genres and users' demographics. Uh, for my personal solution, I can say that uh, there was uh, such things as a recency, so how much time uh, passed from uh, the last user's interaction. Probably it helped uh, the uh, second stage model to switch. Uh, between different like branches uh, uh, and to use different uh, first stage models uh, with different weights. Uh, and also some other features uh, that can be uh, like details of which can be found in the paper. Uh, so in the conclusion, we can say that uh, Kion data set uh, presents uh, challenges uh, that are common in uh, industry and it also can be used for research. Uh, it has implicit uh, structure, it has uh, many time dependent trends, it uh, has a very, very rich metadata and also it can be used for a uh, large variety of tasks uh, for like traditional models, uh, neural models and so on and so forth. Uh, this brings me to the end of the uh, talk. Uh, thank you for the attention. Uh, the slide contains links to the um, uh, data set itself. Also for those who want to play uh, with uh, Sandbox and submit solution, the competition Sandbox is open. And yeah, if there is any questions, I'm happy to answer. So thank you, Alexander.
Any questions? So Alexander, do you think that um, implicit context can really, or implicit ratings can be very different than explicit ratings in terms of contextual kind of uh, data set and contextual information? Does the contextual information really change when it's a implicit rating or explicit rating? Um, for example, yeah. I can give an example in the music domain, right? We have, uh, if people listening to the songs or not, this is type of an, an implicit um, interaction that we have. And there we, we already showed like that contextual information is really important for those kind of scenarios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, it may be like, uh, uh, less important whether or not it is implicit or explicit but i would rather argue that uh, when um, these data sets like netflix or movie links are collected i think i seen some research where um, there was mentioned that users tend uh, to rate items when they don't have to rate them users tend mm -hmm. to rate them when like they are uh, too good or too bad and they are just keep forgetting about items that were kind of average. So that uh, it could be the case that uh, these uh, implicit data sets is more like more representative of uh, mm -hmm. what user is actually doing. And second, it is um, it uh, better represents the sequence because like, for example, uh, if you watch Harry Potter movie one, you, you, you like implicitly you likely to watch Harry Potter 2 and so on and so forth, whereas when you rate them uh, later on, mm -hmm. you can uh, do it in whatever order you want to. Great, thank you. Any other questions? So let's thanks Alexander again. Thank you for your great presentation. And of thank course, you. for the contribution for the community. I hope that uh, now that uh, the data set is uh, public and uh, we have some kind of description of the uh, data set. We will use it for uh, um, further um, projects in context aware. All right, so um, let me conclude um, the presentation and uh, the workshop today. Thank you, Kostya. So um, thank you again for coming for the um, fourth workshop or at least uh, um, the fourth time we do it in Rexis in the last uh, four years. Um, it's really important to me to say about uh, the context aware um, chapter. We have another chapter or updated chapter that we published recently in the handbook, um, which suggests um, more advanced um, methods in context aware and also um, describing the dynamic context and, uh, for example, reinforcement learning in context of recommendation. So we tried to um, suggest new models and present new models in the last few years. So it's online and, um, of course, uh, you can use uh, it and read it and it's um, trying to show the recent developments in the field. Um, so hopefully um, we'll see you all next year online and uh, in person, mostly hopefully in person. Um, so thank you everyone again for uh, joining us and uh, hopefully see you, see you new next year. I want to thanks again to the organizers as Bamshad say. Thank you Kostia, Bamshad, uh, Francesco, Gedas and Alex for organizing it together. Thank you.